All right, everybody, this is Ross the Fig Boss, and welcome back to another fig interview. Today we're with uh, Big Bill. He's located in Lancaster, PA. He has a nursery called Off the Beaten Path Nursery. And actually, he is uh, going to talk with us today about a whole host of different topics about growing figs in the Northeast. We're going to talk about mutations of figs. We're going to talk about all kinds of uh, weird and interesting subjects that we're going to go down in this rabbit hole today. And uh, for those of you guys who don't know Big Bill, as I said, he has a nursery at his home, Off the Beaten Path Nursery. He's selling fig trees right now on his website. But also, he was really one of the first people to help me out when I first got started into growing figs. And so today we're going to talk about Bill's origin story as well. So he's going to talk about that when we start off. But it's just, you know, amazing to to kind of remember where you came from and remember those who helped you out in the beginning. And Bill was always that guy. And I hope to be that person for a lot of you guys. You know, I'm sure Bill, like myself, we're passing on the information that we've gathered over the years, and we're creating all a whole host of new fig growers. And I'm sure Bill would probably just totally agree with the statement that the information that we're gathering and what we're sharing with people, we want people to take this and sort of run with it, right? I mean, we want people to improve what we're already doing. I think Bill could totally attest we're trying to become the best fig growers possible. So if somebody has a great idea and somebody can take something that we've already come up with and run with that and improve it, you know, there's nothing better in my opinion. So Bill, thanks for joining us. Um, please give us a little bit of an intro, how you got into figs, talk about your nursery. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining. Thanks Ross. Um, I started growing figs um, eh, over maybe 20, 25 years ago, I guess. And, uh, you know, I'd never eaten a right fig. I'm from Lancaster County, and we don't grow that stuff. I mean, I, like, this is a Pennsylvania German kind of area. And the Amish and Mennonites, they grew apples and pears and peaches and plums, and they were great at it. Um, but that's, that's what they brought from Germany and so forth. And so it just never, you know, it wasn't local. I, I'd heard of Fig Newtons. Yeah, I don't like Fig Newtons. But, um, <laughs> but like... You know, when I hear about figs and, you know, places that would grow them, and I'm like, nah, I don't think I'd like that because I, I don't like, you know, that, that fig cookie. And um, I was at a nursery, like a, a nice nursery. It was still Lancaster, but um, I smelled the smell. And I, I liked it. Now, I know a lot of people that say, oh, yeah, figs smell like cat pee. I, I, I don't like cat pee. Um, so I, and, 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 but this didn't smell like that. It smelled tropical some coconutty something and it drew, drew my attention and i was in the herb section like i wasn't it wasn't like these are fruit trees this is, this is put in the herb i don't know why but um i, I passed by it i smell this and i i was with my mom at the time and i'm like man that what's is that a fig tree she said yeah and it had a couple figs on it so i'm like well i'm buying it because i, I at least want to know what it tastes like i want to know it was a black mission fig so super hardy anyway um, I, I put it in the ground. My, I asked my Irish mother, I said, what, what do you think, you know, figs? She's like, well, I think they like the shape. So guess how long that tree lasts? Um, among getting killed, because I, I, I joke about that, because Black Mission is not hardy, at least uh, in my experience. Um, but it, the, the figs started turning color. I didn't know when to pick it. Um, so, of course, I picked it early, because that's what people do that don't have experience in waiting, to, you know, for the hang time. But I, I picked it. And I, I, I tasted it, and I thought, There's, this is unbelievable. There's nothing like this. And I would search, but this was kind of when the internet, well, there really isn't a lot of stuff. On it. it wasn't a community right, like the way it is now. So if, you know, all I knew was I liked this big, and I wanted more, and I killed it, so I needed another one. And so I found, you know, a couple of nurseries that had, like, brown turkey. So I bought this brown turkey. It wasn't a brown turkey. Everything gets mislabeled a lot of times as uh, brown turkey, but it was it was us like a Chicago Hardy type, and it was delicious. And so I was super excited. Again, I was, I'm in my 20s, and I think this is the greatest fruit ever. I mean, I grew blueberries, I grew some other things, and and all this, but this was so unique. And so I decided I'm like, well, I know there's you know black figs and white figs. That's all I know. I did. So there's two. There's only two. That's all. So I I start on the Craigslist, and I run into bass. And so I said, so I wanted to meet Bass. I wanted to, you know, I said, hey, I got the dark. I just need the light. 
so he starts smiling, <laughs> and he's, he's like, uh, there's there's more than just, just that. So it's like, oh, really? But I did buy the light. I bought, you know, I think it was like a Brooklyn White or something. And then all of a sudden, you know, he sort of, he really was the guy that brought me in. So, was, you know, in terms of mentors, you know, we all have ours. And that was sort of mine. And, you know, I was I was always excited to go to Best because he had these different rights I'd never heard of. And I want to try them all, you know, but, you know, from my bank account, I could get what I could get. But but I fell in love. And everybody, and I this is almost always the case, is that people will get big fever. Like, you just get it. You start off with one, and, eh, maybe I'll get another one. And you see the photography of some of these things. You know, Bass does a great job of photography. Makes them look just beautiful. And, you know, you're like, well, I got to get that one. So that's how it started for me. And I, to this day, I still, like, I'm interested. It's, it's like, you know, you don't burn. At least I haven't burned out. And like, oh, I got enough fig trees. That, you know, I, I've tasted them all. Well, just like you, you said earlier, it's like you learn more. Like the more you get into it, the more experience you get, the more, you know, you learn about other, what other people are growing and how they're growing it and just learning about, you know, just growing culture. And so that's, you know, that's, I think what we're here for is to get share what we know and then have these guys, you know, try to, you know, say, Hey, well, you know what you did? Well, here's what I did. And many times it's an improvement. So, so Bill, how old are you? Just, if you don't mind. Oh. Forty-seven. Forty-seven. <laughs> okay, okay. So you've been yeah. you've been doing this for a long time, then. Pro- yeah. Probably twenty over, maybe twenty years now. Yeah. Wow. Um. So you know, I I think a lot of people at least saw me when I first got into figs, and I was a presence on the fig communities as someone who was young. You know, didn't really know what they were doing at first, which you know is totally understandable. I didn't really know what I was doing. Um. And so you know, eventually I got better and better at this, and. And then I've sort of evolved and become, I hope, the next generation of what is a fig grower, right? I can't wait for someone to come along that's younger than me, maybe, because now I'm 32, and I can't wait for someone to come along that's 22 that actually has the same drive and passion that you and I have that actually is going to stick around. You know, I think that's the problem. There's a lot of lost information. Um, There's a lot of information that's you know, uh, that's gained and then never shared, or it's, it's just people who get the fig fever, like you said, and they get burnt out and then they're, they're no longer really growing figs. They're happy with their one tree. They're happy with whatever it is that they're doing. And they move on to some other hobby, you know, figs is like to me, and I'm sure it is to you. It's more than just a hobby. It's like a way of life in a way. Um, you know, this is like our, this is our profession. Think about it. Um, so you know, I can't imagine a world that would exist where I'm not growing at least 20 different fig trees. You know, I think, what were you going to say? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I, I agree with you. And I think like, you know, with this mentorship, I, I know you know him, Vasile, uh, Herman too. Um, I went to him early on because he had more data than, I, than anybody I knew. He was, you know, Northeast. He started growing in like 95, 90, 1995, 1996. And it's like all that knowledge, like it had to be shared. Like it really had to be shared. And I mean, he, he was always very generous with it. Um, but I, I do feel like, you know, you have this database. And before there wasn't any written database. It was just word of mouth. You know? And then we created, you know, what oh, I should say. We, but like, you know, this, this era, we, we have this. And it's, it's just cool to see how, how it evolves. And, and so I just want to give him a shout because I met, like he meant a lot to me because he could tell you, he'd say, well, you know, 20 years ago or 15 years ago, we had this weather and this killed the trees or this split, this was a cold summer or whatever. And I listened to that as, as gospel and, and he was right. You know, yeah. it was, we, we needed that though. I needed it to, you know, to, to collect what I did, but then, you know, they, we do have these, you know, people that get, they get older, they drop out and, and so forth. And that's, that's like what you mentioned before about it being so important to carry on and continue to because you know, I get excited about any new variety that I hear about, you know, outside of California with the loft, you know, I, I get I get excited because that's like, well, this may be new. This may be something that you know, because we're still growing. Like we're we're going to continue to do that. We're going to learn more. We're going to find these you know different you know villages that have a tree that's that's you know very important to them. And like you said, it's the story. It's just it, it's more than okay. The fig tastes great. Fig's this color. It belongs in this category. It's like, 
godfather face. There's th- things that have a backstory that you just you just get attracted to. Mm-hmm. It's it's the story, it's the history. So you I mean, you touched on a lot of things there that I would love to you know break down a bit further. First off, Vasile or Vasile uh, VS is his initials, or Herman II, as he was called on the forums. Um, I was lucky enough to be in the the fig growing communities online when he was around. Um, and he, you're right, he was a, the biggest. He was the wealth of. He was the information source for people in the Northeast that knew pretty much all the answers and had so many different things to bring that totally changed everything that you and I are even talking about today. You know, I'm lucky to be able to have that information to then take that to then go somewhere with it. You know, it'd be cool if someone actually had like a scientific background almost that was actually, you know, really deep in the weeds of this that could actually perform experiments and do things on another level that we really can't. Um, Because that would transform this even further, I think. But, you know, again, he was just a great mentor to you. I never really got a chance to to talk to him. I never really got a chance to meet him. I never been to his place, but I only always tried to gather as much as I could. And you can even go back and see all the different things he's ever posted on figs for fun through the archive that someone actually set up. That was extremely intelligent. Whoever did that. Um, And then, you know, there's other mentors like bass. You already mentioned. I mean, he's been in this for a long time in the Northeast. There's also a guy named Georgie in Jersey. Um, And then, I have to give a shout out to my friend Raphael. I know you you know Raphael, but he was the guy who really was my mentor. um, And he really helped me understand all the different varieties and really helped me understand, um, you know, what every fig should taste like and the best, really the best tasting figs. And so his palate was one of the few people to this day that I really um, respect and would actually uh, listen to. Um, So, you know, that, that's a whole thing right there with mentors, and I think everybody needs one. Um, in, t- in terms of some of the other things you, you talked about, um, you know, there is a lot to be said about the story as well with these figs, like Coop found the Godfather fig. Um, I think it just brings to me my attention that you need to come with me to gather and find some of these fig varieties in Philadelphia. Because I, this this winter, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I took two friends, Justin, who's a teacher in Philadelphia, actually as well. I know you're a teacher, Bill. Um, and a, and a guy named, um, uh, Ricky, who is actually a videographer. We, we were actually filming the process of going around Philadelphia and gathering and finding new fig varieties. Um, and if actually it's going to be turned into a movie, it's going to be hopefully pretty interesting for people to watch, but, these varieties are just lost, you know, in terms of finding, you know, a new variety that is common and doesn't need the wasp. There is a huge treasure trove bill of varieties in Philadelphia. It's, it's unbelievable how many there are. Um, and if we, you and I, or somebody doesn't go around Philadelphia or even New York city and find these figs and preserve them and introduce them to the communities. I mean, you just will never really get to experience them. And, you know, I I have never gotten burned out. I just want to end my point on this, and I think we'll we'll transition into that. But I I don't really see myself ever really getting burned out. I mean, I think there's a getting burned out and just growing anything, right? We just at the end of the season, or maybe even by the summer, we're like, all right, I'm tired. I don't want to keep growing food in the hot summer uh, hot summer days. You know, I, I get tired of moving my container fig trees every year. Um, but in general, I mean, you can always grow them in the ground. And to me, what reignites the passion of growing figs every year is actually just tasting them. You know, you eat that first fig off of your tree and you're just like, oh, this is why I'm doing this. You know what I mean? Every little thing we did up to that moment and all the work we did, all the rooting we did, all the finding of these new varieties, all the acquiring of the new varieties, all the container work that we did with feeding them and watering them and all this other crap. As soon as you taste that first fig, it gives you that wow factor and you're back. Yep. Yeah, so, I would agree with that completely because, you know, you do get burned out from a, at least a work standpoint because it is, it's a job. Like it's a job like anything else. It's less of a job if you got it in the ground, but 
you're also it's a little more risky but like you know lugging these things in you know starting them from it's so like I, i'll never not be just in in awe of the fact that you have this little stick you have a stick and it becomes this tree it's just you know you root it and it becomes this thing and it's you know i always call it the giving tree because i, I know of no other you know, plants edible plants whatever that's so giving in terms of you know your cuttings you know your, the, the plants the fruit that itself um the fig leaves for fig leaf tea and wrapping fish and all this no matter what you know it's so useful so giving and and also you're not it's not an apple tree where you're waiting seven years to get fruit i mean it's many times you're getting them within a year or two mm -hmm. and you get to so it's, you're not having to wait that that incredibly long time just to enjoy what you're you know, the fruits of your labor and i mean it, it's it makes it all worth it like you taste in that first fig and you're exactly right and you just you're like, yep, I'm in, I'm back in. I think a lot of people that are that got way into the figs and they had all these varieties, they probably just, you know, life circumstances happened and then they just couldn't do it. Um, I know a lot of people like that. Um, you know, I know people who have crossed states, crossed borders, you know, moved across the country and they brought their figs with them. I mean, yep. So I I think there's oh, a. Oh. Uh, no, go ahead. No. I was just gonna say, some people move because uh, <laughs> because, they, because they can grow their figs. I mean, that's true. It and, is and true. In a few cases, just off the top of my head. So. Yeah, absolutely. So I I I don't get the whole burned out thing. I just don't think. I don't know. I I would I'd be curious to see what people. I think people get turned off for a number of reasons, but I don't think being burned out is usually a common reason. Maybe you, you really hurt your back or something, or yeah. you know, you got hurt physically and you can't wrap a tree or you can't grow figs in containers anymore uh i think once you're in this and you become obsessed you're kind of in this for life that's that's my opinion um yeah. now to what extent because you there has to be an uh, a means to an end right i mean how many fig varieties can you and i grow <laughs> Like, what is the, what, like, peop, you know, this is the other thing, right? I want to, I, I'm sure it would be a great I, I thing to talk to you about because people will get burned out, right? But also, what about just, like, when is enough enough? When do you stop? And should you stop? I don't think so. I mean, I, I think, I, from my, my answer to that would just be, well, I, I don't think you stop. I think you can call some of your collection if they're performing or, or it's you know just you, you grew it just to, to give it a shot and it's just not one of your tops and you get, but to, to not pursue continuation of the perfect fee i mean i i think you know you find a smith or something like that and you say well that's pretty cool you know can you beat that and that's very tough to do and to, to your point earlier about you know the philly to, I, I had a um you know a buddy of mine uh tom who's used to live in, a, in the Brooklyn. He's like, hey, we got to take a trip. So I'm like, all right. We took a trip to Brooklyn. He's showing me all, like, his old Italian neighborhood, and everyone has a trip in there. And, but they're all different. And you're, it's, it's almost like this is the holy grail. Like, we're searching for it. Because if the, if the tree's here, they brought it, the, the immigrants brought it for a reason. It's like, hey, either it's, I, I really like this, it's my family tree, or, but the, the fact that it still remains tells you, well, okay, it could survive. It could survive in this climate, which really interests me right away. I mean, we went from house to house, and we would be like, knock on the door, and say, hey, can you tell us a little about your fig tree? And they would, and, you know, they give us some cuttings, and then the next door neighbor would be like, hey, come here. Like, you don't want that tree. That tree's no good. My family tree's better. So they give you, so now you got all these cuttings that you got to uh -huh. separate or, or at least designate, like, okay, this is whatever. But, that's the search for the Holy Grail. And I think it, for me, it'll never end. It'll never end because it, like Aaron uh, Delmato found all those ones in Northern New Jersey. They're extremely interesting to me, even if they're similar or whatever, mm -hmm. but it's the fact that they have made it, they have survived here for mm -hmm. that long, 60 years, whatever it might be, is, is very interesting to me. You know, for, if not for the, the flavor, for the hardiness and, and just the durability of it. If you found the perfect fig, if it does exist and you have it, would you stop? I'd still, you know, it's like, 
well, maybe there's another, you know, maybe there, you know, because how would you know, you know? So it's like, you know, it's, it's like, well, you always have that question in your mind is, is until the, the earth's been scoured of, you know, when this, when this um, phenomenon hits, hits the, you know, where everybody from everywhere, because I just, I'll tell you, I just ran into uh, an Iraqi couple and they live here. And they were buying some things for me. And he, they said, oh, you know, you know where the best figs are grown is in Iraq. You know, because you, you tigers for Euphrates. And, and I was like, whoa. And he's like, yeah. And the figs are big. They're beautiful. I'm like, oh, man, it's too bad you don't have it. Like, Actually, we do. We have one that we brought. And, you know, right away, I'm hooked. It's a story. It's cool. They, they've, they, they brought it because it was important to them. Yep. You know, they grew it and they love it. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, so I'm you know, I'm in, you know, let's, let's, you know, let's find out more about it. So I think it's like how, how everybody's got their own favorite and everybody said, well, this came from here, this came from here. But I think we, there's a lot of data that still needs to be collected in my opinion. Yeah. I, I don't think the job's ever done. And I think there is at least for me, I feel good about it in some way that I feel like I'm doing good for not just me, but I'm doing good for other people and finding a fig that is perfect for my climate or perfect for the Northeast. You know, I think that actually does a lot of good for a lot of people who are inevitably going to get into this. You know, a lot of people are going to have fig trees. I mean, there's already so much more interest every day. Um, now is sure not everyone's going to have a fig tree, but you know, I think just to have access to more than just the standard varieties. I mean, if you think about what already existed before a lot of us came along, Smith was was one of them. Vila de Bordeaux, Hardy Chicago, Celeste. Um, those are probably the best of the ones that already existed. And those are great figs. I mean, it's yeah. it's crazy to even think that you're trying to find something better than Celeste. You know, I, I think that's the perfect fig for anyone in a humid place. You yeah. could, I'm sure you could argue that Hardy Chicago is hardier and therefore maybe better for certain people. But, um, you know, how do you find something better than Celeste? It just blows my mind. How do you find something better than Smith that is already amazing, almost at the level of, of Celeste in humid weather, but then yeah. tastes like, you know, the best tasting fig you can grow for the most part? So it's like, it's a tall task, but believe it or not, and I'm sure you could attest to this, uh, some of the figs you have found, but for me, I feel like I've already found maybe even 10 figs that are on that same level. I even have a, I think I have a top 16 list right now that I published last fall that I would say there's 16 figs that are like amazing for this particular climate. Now, can they all be grown in the ground? Are they all as hardy? Do we need more data? Yeah. Um, so I, I just, for you, let me, let me ask you this though. What is the perfect fig? Well, I, I don't know. Um, I like at, at least, you know, cause you could argue, say, well, you know, Smith can stand up to humidity better than any of that I know of, you know, except for it's, it's equal, which would be Celeste, I think. But, you know, flavor wise, even the earliness of it, like, that those two criteria it's like oh yeah this is it until you get to you know the the lignification and and you know the real hardiness area uh uh, dan from uh louisiana who was i don't know if you remember him but he was like way back when i think he was a chemist or something um and he said about he's like well good luck to you in the northeast because in zone nine smith will die back on you and i was like You've got to be kidding mm-hmm. and it's like he said that you know it would die back you know in louisiana so it's yeah. like um and i you know i choose usually get now i don't protect mine so it's my own fault but you know i almost always get total die back um as long as i've grown it and you know to to add um you know when 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 the question is asked like well what's what's the best thing I mean, I go back to 2013, 2014 during the so-called, I, I hate the name, but polar vortexes. Um, and it got so cold and everybody's like, Philadelphia, there would be trees that were there for 50 years and, and they were fine. And then boom, they're, they're dead. And just like that. And I mean, it was, it was incredible. And I'm sure we'll have it again. 
So it's like, what could, what could stand up to that? You know, I, I don't know. That, that's, that's actually when I found Paramount, which is kind of odd because, you know, because everybody, even in the Oxford, uh, Eastern, like Eastern Shore version of Maryland, you know, their tree, they I never had to worry about anything. Their trees were dead. And this was the only tree that I, that I found that was surviving. I mean, it was because of a microclimate, but nevertheless, you know, he, they had, you know, figs on them that were almost ripe at the end of July. So I was just like, man, this is something. So I, I would, I'm not, certainly not saying Terramo is the, the, the one. I'd say Terramo is early. Uh, you know, I wouldn't call it a you know, super delicious fig or anything, but um, oh, I had great. some that were, I've had some that, if, you know, if we don't get rain, they can be pretty <clears throat> sweet. They can be pretty tasty. But, um, but boy, I, I don't know. Because I, like, I used to be a fan, and we talked about this way back when we did our first video, about Ron de Bordeaux. And I felt really good about, yeah, that, that's my favorite. And, yep. and I really would never say that now. I, I would. Um, and that's, again, more, we collect more data. We find more, you know, we grow things for years and find out, boy, this is really good. This is better. This is, and, you know, drops down the list a little bit. You know, it's great, again, for its earliness. Um, I think flavor can be good. I think if it doesn't split, which uh, at least mine in the ground are just, I mean, they split. That's that's it. So I wish I had like, oh, well, this is it. This is the perfect thing. But boy, you know, I think I think just because of the variables that we that we have with weather, cold, rain, whatever, it's it's. I, I, I mean, I've been doing this over 20 years, and I I, I still think I, I'm like I don't know. I don't know yet. I, I'm hoping to find that out someday. So. I would agree with you. There is no perfect fig yet, but there will be. And in regards to Smith, really quickly, I have a theory, and I want to share this with you and then get your thoughts on it. So as you know, and I'm sure you would agree, the lignification is, is a problem. Yep. So typically what happens with Smith, I've noted, is that it just grows too quickly. Um, and I find I've, I've learned – especially after you know every year just my trees getting smashed by the cold and then them getting having a re-sprout from the base and then this year i did a lot of uh limb bending where i preserved at least one of the branches bent it over covered it with wood chips um or this year i even did some wrapping and was able to observe what i had at least imagined was the the particular buds on the fig tree are different in that the apical and lateral buds, so the topmost highest buds on the branches, have a different hormonal component than the other buds on the fig tree. So you can kind of visually see it um, when the branches are dormant, and you'll see obviously the apical bud, but the lateral buds, I don't know, maybe they only go down about four inches, six inches, maybe 10 inches if you're lucky. They're, diff they're typically protruding buds that have a lot of energy in them. Um, you know, they're, they're buds that are expanded a bit further, whereas other buds on the fig, you'll, and you, you've seen this, I'm sure, a million times, Bill, is that the buds are, like, more dormant on the, on the wood. And typically, the more dormant they are, the lower they are on the branch. And this is also occurring uh the same hormonal problem occurs not just with these i've nicknamed them by the way the vegetative buds so the buds that are lower down that are not the the apical and lateral buds they're called vegetative or at least what i've called them the suckers that come up from the base or from the soil are also what i would consider vegetative but they're slightly different in that there's still a varying degree of horm hormonal balance that's happening so one hormone you know, helps with growth. One hormone helps with fruiting. And so they have to be in balance for the fig tree to fruit. If one, like Smith, is just frequently in the balance of growing, it doesn't fruit. Now, if you grow it in a container, you'll notice that after a couple years, maybe in that third year, actually, it may even take three years from cutting or that third season from cutting, it'll eventually slow down. You preserve enough of that wood. You don't prune it. You keep the apical and lateral buds from last year, and it typically fruits either in that second or third year from those buds that typically are in better balance. So what I try to tell people nowadays is that if they're pruning their trees really hard, 
and they're only leaving those vegetative buds, you're going to have a lot harder of a time getting them the fruit. You know this without a doubt. I mean, the branches that come up as suckers, they're almost impossible sometimes to get them the fruit. The only real way you can get them the fruit is with what Herman said many years ago, is thinning them out at the base. You select five or seven suckers at the base. You get rid of the rest. Why do you do that? You do that because you want to you want to make sure each of those is getting enough sunlight. The sunlight is what is controlling the fruit set on these branches. As they grow, there's a sunlight requirement that's needed for those those buds to actually set fruits. However, if the hormones are out of balance, which they normally are with the suckers, again, it's really difficult to get them the fruit. So Smith, what I've noticed is that because it grows so quickly, it just doesn't lignify in time. It'll grow all the way until frost. And other trees that you have, I'm sure you've noticed this, Bill, is that they stop at a certain point in the summer or they'll stop at a certain point in the fall, and they're lignified, ready to go for this first frost that comes in. And they don't take damage in November and December and January because they're already lignified and they're already pretty much died. They, they even sometimes all their leaves will fall off before I even get a frost. So Smith just doesn't do that because historically, if you grow it in the ground, it's just going to be out of this hormonal balance. So the only way I've noted, and I haven't tried it with Smith. I've only tried it with Texas BA1. And this is a long thing I I want, but this is really important. Texas BA1 is probably, in my opinion, it's slightly different than Smith. Now, if you look on Edible Landscaping's website, Michael McConkie, who's just the guy who pretty much has been promoting it for many years, says it it will survive in Zone 7. He's in a 7B. Um, he says it'll survive in a 7B protected from the wind. So I said, all right, well, let's plant it here. I'm in 7A. What the heck? Why not? So I grew out a tree. I don't know how big it was, but this is now its third season in the ground where it has survived the winter. Now, the last three winters or so have been rather mild, um, here at least. And this winter, I think we got down to, to maybe eight, or no, last winter we got down to six. But this winter, I think we only got down to 10. So not really exactly the best representation of what would be you, you consider a very hardy fig. But what I can tell you is that the tree this year has finally slowed down. It took three years now, it's third season, for it to actually stop growing so quickly. Now, last year it lignified perfectly. This year it lignified perfectly. But it's finally slowed down enough to where it's actually fruiting in the ground, and it's going to have a ton of fruits on it. Um, I'm not going to have a a lot of them because Texas BA1 seems to have a lot of light that it requires. So I'm probably expecting, I'm hoping for maybe 45, 50 figs. but to me, that's just amazing that we could actually, in theory, assuming we can get the hormones to behave properly, I'm very curious to see if I could get Smith to survive the winter at least until we get something severe. Now, if I have to protect it, it's actually not that big of a tree because the more we can keep them in that balance, the slower they grow, the more they fruit. And in actuality, they be, they're just smaller trees. And so I think... Having it against my house has been a great advantage, but um, anyway, I just wanted to share that with you because I don't think people put enough importance on those different buds that, that the fig tree has and how the hormones are controlling pretty much everything in our fig trees. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm still, you know, with, with Smith, I, you know, I, for years I know people have said, you know, don't put it in the ground, but I, don't, I never listen. No, because I, I I need to know for myself, and I'll, I'll do that with any any tree. You know, I put black madeira in the ground, and I did that because Gene Hosey, uh, East Coast figs, if you recall, you know he had down in D.C. He had an orchard. He you know he had one of the first online businesses I've ever for figs that I've that, that I can recall. I mean I think the site's all completely down now, but um, you know he had black madeira in the ground, and you know Virginia a little bit warmer, but um, you know I I got to try. And to your point with Smith about slowing that down, I mean, I look at look at Black Madeira. You know, that's you you don't have to try real hard for that slow growth, but yet a lot of figs. They look like little doorknobs. I mean, they 
they really, really kick in fruit. They're, they're heavy on the fruit, um, you know, fruit to growth ratio, which I think is kind of interesting. And there's some of those black Madeira types, or at least that I consider to be black Madeira types, um, that do the same. So, yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, to, to, to the, the one thing that I found incredible this year, and, and Herman said it, um, he had an Italian 258 in the ground, and he said, and I agree, that the difference between, sorry, I'm jumping around, but um, the difference between like black Madeira and Italian 258 is that ripening window is tight when it comes to Italian 258. And I went to his place and it was Halloween. And, um, you know, he said that there, it was almost like the crown jewel of his whole yard was this one enormous Italian 258. And he had it all, you know, kind of, it was sort of sunken in. And he had an awful lot, like a thermal mass around it. I mean, it was it was in a it was it was in a mount. And um, he said, "You see that tree?" And I was like, "Yeah." He's like, "That's a tag two fifty eight. And I'm like, "How come it doesn't have any figs on it?" He goes, "It finished." And I I was like, "You gotta be kidding me!" I put mine in. We had that long, long like that fall. We before we got a hard frost, I ripened all of my tag two fifty eights in the ground, unprotected, and I had. I think I sent to the restaurants probably 20 pints within Whoa. a week and a half. And they just all, they just were ripened, boom, 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 just all the way up. And the tree wasn't all that big. It was in that perfect hormonal balance, I think, just like you were talking about, where, I, I mean, it, for, the, for the size that it was, the amount of fruit that I got, I mean, it was incredible. Yeah, I think, um, well, I did the same thing, by the way. I planted my Italian 250 and my black Madeira in the ground just following in his footsteps. Neither one of them have produced anything since I've planted them uh, for the most part. Now, here's the problem, though, is I have not been able to protect them properly. So if I would have, I did protect Italian 258 somewhat successfully, but if you do the same thing with Smith and you still have dieback on the tips of the branches, you're not going to see success. In fact, my Italian 258 is, is growing like, you know, a crazy person right now. Um, and it's just because of those buds. So what, I, what I'm going to do, hopefully this year, and succeed this fall, is protect my Black Madeira, my Italian 258, a number of other trees that just for whatever reason didn't survive underneath the wood chips. And um, if I can get them through the wintertime, plop them back up in the spring, they, will, they should be in that hormonal balance, and I should see the fruit set. And here's how you know, Bill, that I've noticed this year, if they're in, if they're in the balance, you don't have to, you know, look, look at them underneath the microscope or like, you know, see the hormones somehow scientifically, you can tell by looking at the node spacing, yeah. the distance between the leaves, the distance between the, the nodes, it's a clear sign. There's actually a number of trees that when I, I plop them back up this year, the top buds are growing very slowly and they're fruiting right now. The bottom buds that also are growing along with the top buds are growing extremely vigorously to the point where I have a one tree, a white triana in particular, that the lower buds, the vegetative buds that I've been talking about, are actually surpassing the, the higher growth. Even though the, the buds higher up have the dominance that you would think, the lower buds are growing so quickly because of their hormones, and they're not fruiting either. They're just shooting right past them and they're eventually going to shade out the the top of the 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 branch there um so i think that's the name of the game right there and of course that you know it really proves the point that we're what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a hardy fig right we're trying to find something that's going to survive the winter all the buds are going to be intact i mean we don't want just partial dieback or partial sur we don't want the tree to partially survive. We want, really want the whole thing to survive. Um, and so I guess that would be a part of what would be the perfect fig, right? Yeah. And I'll tell you another thing that this is my theory anyway. And one of the reasons I think I, besides being a little colder than you probably, um, that I was able to have the success with the Italian 258 um, is its age. Mm. I firmly, firmly believe that as you get a more extensive root system, you know, you're drawing a lot more nutrients. Like I, I, I'll find that like if I get total dieback from a uh, from the tree, which I mean it happens frequently because I do what you're not supposed to do, which is you know cut way way back. But I, I do that for cuttings because that's you know my bread and butter. 
So I have to do it. So it's not something that I would recommend, certainly, especially yeah. after what we just talked about there. But um, what I did notice is that they will outpace, even in terms of like maturity, they, they will sometimes outpace like a, a potted fig that's just as mature that, you know, I've cart in and out, no dieback on it, just because it's got this incredible reservoir to draw from. You know, so it's, I mean, it's putting on feet, you know, and, and, you know, just that fig formation is a little quicker, even if it's coming from behind. It's, it, that's why I, I really believe that if, if you can get, I think it just gets, and I don't know if adaptation is like, is that fast? I'm not sure. I, I don't think it is where it's able to just, you know, be able to just, Hey, this is a cold climate. We can adapt. But I think that the, I mean, I, I've dug, I've dug up more fig trees than I want to remember, especially ones. Even my neighbors, it was like eight year old. It was an eight year old fig tree, and you know, it was planted right underneath a holly tree, which those things are disgusting. And it wasn't getting any sun, so I, I, I was like, hey, I'll help you dig it out. And he was like, nah, that's been in there for eight years. It's not coming out. I got about a foot and a half, and I was under it. I mean, that just shows you like how in our area. Now, maybe not in California, they do have to, that's why when people say, oh man, don't put it near your house, it'll ruin your foundation, I don't believe that. As a matter of fact, I have 20 years, uh, I, I have a, my original fig tree that I planted um, against my foundation right, right on the uh, walkout, uh, and it's fine. And because fig trees will, they'll use whatever's the least resistant, path of least resistance, they hit that, they'll start going outward because we get all plenty of rain not this season, but we usually get plenty of rain. They don't have to go down to get water. They go out. And they and now I speed shovel all the way around it, but it, it, it was incredibly easy to, to remove an eight-year-old fig tree. It really wasn't that big a deal. The root ball was heavy. That's about it. That was the problem. And, you know, they recover pretty well. So transplanting a fig tree is, you know, if for anybody wondering, you know, it's not, it's not real hard, especially if you do it the right time of year. So, um, why don't we talk a little bit about uh, the adaptations? Because you did sort of mention that uh, briefly there. Um, you did say that you found, or at least there's an adaptation that you came across recently. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, un unbelievable. Um, a Mount Etna type of fig tree that was you know, grown in our central Pennsylvania area. Um, like a, just, a, just a Chicago hardy type that's known as Tacoma Violet down in Tacoma Park, uh, Maryland. It's where it was discovered. I, I can't remember. I think it might have been Gene Hosey that found that. But um, it, it, in his tree that he's been growing in the ground, central Pennsylvania, five years, all of a sudden a, a sport appears. And the sport happens to be variegated. Now, you know, that, that's amazing. Uh, it, to me, that's amazing is that Somehow a Chicago hardy type. We're not talking about a panache. We're not talking about. We're talking about something that is known that has, you know, is has that lineage that has that those genetics that would be sold as almost like a Chicago hardy. It could happen to that. All of a sudden, it develops this sport where the wood is variegated, the leaves are also become variegated, and the fruit is of course variegated. But the fruit ripens in such a manner that it, it's it does what a Mount Etna thing you would think would do. It's not gonna keep a, a, a yellow and green striped fig. No, it starts that way, yeah. But in the same model as uh, Martinica Romana, it, it has, it will start that way and as it ripens, it will change the color of the variegations from you know, yellow and, and green to, um, in this case, more so and doesn't lose the variegation the way Martinica Romana does when it gets you know, almost completely black as it ripens. This actually keeps like kind of a wild, like pink color and, and, and the purple, the standard purple, which I think is very unique. And it's, it's something that I think has to be shared. It has something to that, that makes it unique in its hardiness because, you know, at least for me, it's a challenge to grow variegated figs, you know, because where they come from, you know, typically where they were grown originally, you know, you, you, you're gonna do it a pot if you try it in the ground, you know, which I have done by the way, um, it, they, they almost always, I mean, I'm talking um, Col de Dom, Ramada, uh, BNR, just some of the other ones, um, Papone. If they don't revert, then they just almost all, you know, die back completely. 
Like they are just not ready for this type of climate. And I don't know if they will become, I still am trying to grow them in the ground to find out if they will adapt if, or, or if they get enough extensive um, rooting root system that would do that. But this particular example really excites me because it, it just, I mean, this is something that I don't know of anybody else that has ever reported that. I mean, it's not my find necessarily, but I think it's, I think it's just an incredible, an incredible, uh, you know, an adaptation that, that happened. It's just genetic uh, mutation that occurred on one branch, which became, you know, one tree. Um, and that's, I just, I find it fascinating. It is fascinating. Um, so the Tacoma violet uh, variegated, does it eventually turn purple or black like uh, like Martinique Ramada? It'll it'll lose the striping. Well, it, it retains the striping. I mean, I, I wish I had a picture. I wish I had a picture, but um, I I know I can get a picture. Um, but that that pink, it's like a hot pink. Yeah. It, maybe I'm uh -huh. using purple, but, but it's 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 pink, uh, and doesn't go to like the red, purple. So the pink sort of stays pink, and the, at least the sample size that I've seen, like the, the number of uh, ripened figs that, that I have seen, um, have, have kept this variegation, at, at least this new variegation from yellow and, and green to, to kind of a pink, pink purple mm -hmm. uh, combo. It's interesting. Um, also interesting, the flavor, and, and again, it, because this one is very difficult to determine when to pick. I picked it early, I know this, you know, because you know the flavor wasn't right, and I I, I want to believe that if you know you let that the, pro, the, the the appropriate amount of hang time, where you do see some you know some wrinkling, I think then then you'd have your same flavor. I'm guessing as a normal Tacoma violet, but just the, the interesting stripes. Right. Now, for those people who don't know um, what a what a Ramada fig is. It's a chimera mutation. Um, and so figs, in my opinion, they mutate a lot more than we give them credit for. Um, you know, every single bud, I, I talked a little bit about this with, uh, with the buds of the fig tree in terms of their hormones. Every single bud, I feel, has a different, uh, four different things. They have a different hormonal component, a different carbohydrate component, they have a different level of fig mosaic virus within them. And they are sometimes, and in most cases, I think, even slightly genetically different in terms of a mutation. So every different bud has a chance to potentially mutate on that fig tree to be different than the mother plant. This is uh, quite common that you'll see in um, all the Ramada figs that Bill just mentioned. But also there's a fig called uh, Majoum or Little Miss Figgy that is supposed to be a branch mutation of Villa de Bordeaux. Um, there's also this new fig that's out. You probably heard of it, Fig Nominal, Bill. Uh, that's yeah. also a branch mutation of uh, Hardy Chicago. Um, and so, you know, I think this is such an interesting topic because if you, if you believe what I just said in that, these mutations happen more often than we think. This means that, well, it could explain a lot of how we see these hardy Chicago types or a lot of these different figs that we think are very similar to each other. Maybe at one point there was like a very old, let's say a thousand years ago or 500 years ago, a hardy Chicago fig that was the first seedling that was ever planted. Then you have, you know, a branch mutation of that. Of course, a fig like Hardy Chicago is going to travel. It's respected. It's hardy. It's going to go all over the world. It's going to eventually be propagated here. Then it's going to make its way over there. And, of course, it's just going to keep changing and mutating. And over hundreds of years, you're going to see a lot of change in that particular fig. Um, could that be the explanation of why we're seeing so many um, different Hardy Chicago figs and what explains all the little differences between them. That's my belief. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I think you see subtle differences all the time within the family. Like, what, you know, do you include red Lebanese? Do you include, and I'll tell you something that I find very interesting and uh, is 
Macedonia Dark. I don't know if you grow it, but it doesn't have the classic, um, I call a sword shape, because, you know, with that five, with the, almost like the handle and blade of the, you know, the, and, you know, that hairy appearance, almost like, you know, that fuzzy uh, kind of the, the, the texture of it. Macedonia Dark, at least for me, um, does not have that classic shape. It, but yet the fruit, you know, it's it hard to argue that it wouldn't be. Um, but, you know, even just within that family, if you, if you consider, you know, the Hardy Chicago family, the Mount Etna family, how many subtle differences there are in size of the fruit, ripening time. You know, the, these are things like that you've said. It's like maybe that first one was the standard, but but this, you know, this um, variation, this, this almost uh, migration of, of characteristics that are like, well, this one, you know, may start out to be this, but different leaf shape, different size of the fruit, different ripening time, flavor, of course. You know, so there's, you know, there's even just the drop of, you know, like with Azores Dark, you know, if you want to, if you want to try to say, well, that's the same. I mean, I dare you because, you know, I, I, I think what you have there is, you know, this drop of honey that's almost classic, you know, that you don't see, you know, in too many, you know, other ones that would be in that same family. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it, it, and that's just, we're just investigating one type. I mean, there's, you know, we could go Peter's Honey, we could go all these different directions, but, you know, the I, I think the one that's most significant, at least for the northern grower, is the is the Chicago Hardy type. So that that's why, you know, these subtle differences. I, I just found one, um, called, uh, I just called it Unknown Marine Park, because that's where it was in, in Brooklyn. And man, I, I I I don't know if it was the time of, of ripening or what, but I was like, this is one of the tops that I've ever had. And and who knows what it? Nobody knows what it. It's sitting in a vacant parking lot, just waiting to be discovered. And that's and that's what I think. You know, which circle back to what we talked about before is like there are many many out there that still are yet to be discovered. And I say discovered because they've forgotten. You know the. So many times I've heard people say, yeah, well, uh, well, unknown Sicilian dark, just as a quick side note. Um, couple, a, a Sicilian couple brings it from Sicily to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, 1972. Grows it there, 40th anniversary, they, whatever. They, they leave, and part of the agreement for the people that are buying their new house is that please don't cut down that tree. That's a legacy. So the first thing the guy does is this is back when Craigslist was a thing. And I, uh, you know, I, I had my little, this is, I didn't have a business or anything. I just had, hey, fig trees for sale, whatever. This guy calls me and he's like, hey, I, I don't, I don't want any fig trees. I have a fig tree. I'm about to cut it down. I'm get, about to get rid of it. Um, do you want any branches of it? Do you want any fruit? And because he goes, I'm, I'm going to do it in October. I'm like, don't do anything. <laughs> Let me, you know, so I tried the fruit, grapefruit. Um, and in the fall, I said, I, I'm sorry. I know you're going to cut this tree down. May I help you? He says, sure, yeah. So I just, I grabbed my, my pruners. And I took as many as I could because I wanted to preserve. I think it's a cool story. I think these guys thought so much of it that they wrote it into their agreement, their sales agreement, you know, that he violated. But, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, but I, but I really thought that that thing had been in Lancaster County, where I lived for 40 years, and it was enormous. It was absolutely the guys, the the, the couple knew exactly what they were doing. They found south facing, the chimney, is where they planted it, which I think is genius. Because if you think about well, what you know, when would you use the fireplace? Well, when it's the coldest, so it's going to radiate that heat on the coldest days of the year. And I thought. Man, what a great what a great microclimate that I hadn't even considered at the time. Mm -hmm. So I just wow. I thought that was yeah I thought that was neat and that I I think I would argue is a little different than some of your other Mount Etnas and you know and I I think that there's there's just there's so many variables. Norella is another one that I think is kind of a you know is outside the mold of what your classic Chicago yeah. Hardy type. They're not all created equal for sure. I had yeah. one in Philadelphia this past uh, fall, uh, this past uh, September probably or August. And we've been eyeing it up, my girlfriend and I, in uh, Queens Village. We were just walking around. And it's, it's actually right near Royal Izakaya for anyone that's um, 
familiar with Queen's Village and, and knows Royal Zakai. It's a very good Japanese restaurant. But um, there's a fig tree in the alley right behind it, and it's in someone's house, but it's so big that it's coming over the, into the alley, and it's, it's like 20 feet tall. You tell it's been there for a while. Um, you know, it wasn't getting a ton of sun, so it had to really grow into this spot, and it, you could tell it took a long time for it to do that. And I, I been eyeing the figs, taste the figs, and I just realized they're not that good. I was, <laughs> I was really shocked because I'm like, I know it's a hearty Chicago. We've been eyeing it up, telling my girlfriend this is a hearty Chicago. This is a hearty Chicago, <laughs> and we get to it. And eat it, and I'm thinking to myself, it's it's just such an old tree. It's got to have a really well developed root system. It probably doesn't even get a ton of water. I mean, it was a dry year last year. We had a we had a drought. It should have been the best fig ever, and it was just an average tasting, or even below average tasting, hardy Chicago type. And so it just proves the point right there. I mean, they're just not all created equal. Um, I don't know where they got their hardy Chicago fig from. Maybe they got it from a nursery. Maybe they brought it from Italy. Who knows? But they're not all created equal. I'll tell you this interesting point about Sicilian dark, Bill, is I have Sicilian dark, and I remember you told me, I think you told me in a message years ago, you're like, yeah, Sicilian dark's, um, uh, it's like a workhorse fig. It, it always super, super hardy, performs really good. It produces a lot of fruit. But it's just, the, you know, it's not the best tasting hardy Chicago um, because you know we, as we know, there's a lot of good hardy Chicago's out there. Um, right. and so I was like, oh, okay, whatever. But my friend, you know, our friend Craig, who lives in Yardley, actually came to my house and brought one actually, and just gave me a Sicilian dark. And so I was like, okay, well, what do I do with this? Let me just plant it out front. So I planted it uh, in a hardiness experiment I have out there. It does great, but in that spot is actually a very dry soil there was a big shade tree that used to exist there and it got hit by lightning twice so we took it out it's a cursed tree yeah and you could tell there was just something different about the soil where it was planted i don't know if it's just because it the tree has been there so long and changed the soil i don't know if maybe because it wasn't uh when we built this house many years ago it wasn't developed that that area so they didn't add all this crazy bad topsoil and they just didn't disturb the soil there i'm not sure um but in any case the soil it, it just drains super well there it's so difficult actually to get them to stay moist and to grow because they just it's just so dry um so this year i added a ton of wood chips to correct that but every year i've ever had any figs from that plot they have been incredibly good they have tasted it's a, a significant difference um and in fact we did a tasting here at the house um last year and romeo was there romeo asaf shout out to romeo he um tasted the sicilian dark figs that i harvested compared to some dead ripe perfect azores dark figs also compared to um i think i had some cond i had some i had some really good hardy chicago's there that day and hit that was his favorite the sicilian dark Wow, that's surprising. If Romeo said that, then that 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 means something. Because I'm, you know, I that that that's interesting. I mean, because I I would I always called it like a very average, you know, Chicago type. I mean, I but that's funny that that he would say that. So the berry flavor actually on it is the most intense berry flavor out of any of the Hardy Chicagos I've had, oh. and I I do think it's just because of that dry soil. And I I'm agree. very curious if I planted it somewhere else, if I grew it in a pot would it still taste the same? What I've done now to take that argument and apply it to other hardy Chicago's, I used to love Malta Black. Malta Black was planted in the same exact plot that the Sicilian Dark was in. I dug it up and moved it because I didn't want figs there for some reason. It's just, you know, you know how that goes. And moved it to a, a different side of the yard. I've yet to taste the figs off of it, but I'm going to start to think I actually have one out in a container because I really was thinking maybe if I taste these Malta black figs, they won't be as good as I remember them because of that dry soil. So I'm really curious. I'm going to get a plenty of fruit off my, uh, my pot of tree, but, uh, the in-ground's still getting established at this current moment. But anyway, there's food for thought right there on that whole, that whole subject. Yeah. I mean, there's so that's what kills me. And I, and I always try to refrain from, 
you know, saying too much about a particular variety too soon, but all the variables between sunlight, between the soil type, between whether we got rain or not, where it's planted. Um, I mean, I did a video at one time of, of three Mount Etna types right in a row, same age and all that. And there was some variances and in, in dieback on one of the, I can't remember which one it was, but the other two were remain strong. And they're, I mean, they're identical in every way. And so I thought that was that was enough of a, that was valuable enough to to report, but otherwise, you know, that when somebody else said, "Man, that this tree's you know no good," and you know, it's it's or this tree's really early, and I said, "Well, how many how many trees do you have?" Oh, just one. You know, that's that's not a lot of data, you know, and especially if it's like one one tree one year, like I'm gonna need a little little more. Like I, I don't I just don't want to fall in love with something or follow something necessarily until I've seen, like I got. Um, I think I have like four Iranian candies in the ground because I, I've had just some mixed, mixed results from that particular variety. Where, you know, I've I've had one like I don't often have big trees die die. They can die back, but for them to be dead dead is is pretty uncommon. Mm -hmm. And and if it does, like I had a Ron de Bordeaux that that died. It was because it caught some kind of a, it, it was it was a fungus. It was kind of this, this orange stuff that grew on and it, and it killed, that's what killed it. It wasn't like, oh, wow, it's super cold. Iranian candy, the very first one I planted, it was dead. Like the first year, you know, I, you know, I'm like, this thing's not coming back. And it didn't, you know, sometimes I'll be like, this thing's not coming back. And in July, it just sprouts up. Yep. So it's like, you know, way late bloomer. And that's a killer, by the way. But like, um, but I, so I thought, well, you know, that's, that's one trial. You know, and you know, I know that Steve uh, Northware, you know, he, I think he swears by it. You know, he's pretty much the same zone. And so I'm thinking, well, I, you know, I can't, I can't start saying, you know, just crapping all over this thing, saying like, no, it's not hardy at all, because I, I, that was one tree, you know, in the ground, one or two years. So I, you know, tried again. So now, I, if before I'm gonna, you know, say one way or the other. I, you know, I want to have some good data year after year, plant after plant, not just one plant. And, and that's how I try to make, you know, some of my, if, if I'm going to report on something like for me, like, like Randino was one that was a real surprise, like a real pleasant surprise, but I, I didn't want to say anything. I kept that quiet for a couple of years. So I really thought, boy, you know, I, this is, this has been consistent. It's enough time to, to probably you know, share that information. And I think that that might be a pretty good one. So, you know, I'll tell you another st quick story about, um, that the exact thing you just said, I have a Campanieri. I had actually, I think f at one point five Campanieris planted in the ground here. Um, yeah. And one of them actually ended up dying. Um, and by the way, they're at different places in my yard. I have one on the North side. I have one on the I have two on the West side. Uh, actually three on the west side in two different plots. I have, and then I had two on the north side. So the north side's where the, the dry soil is. Um, so I have two planted in the dry soil. The uh, I have one in that dry soil, not two of them, not both of them, but although they did survive this year, both of them, um, there is one of them, though, that's going to produce roughly 300 figs on it this year. Wow. Now... If you look at the other three trees I have, I would not consider it hardy at all. Uh, it, it actually really doesn't. It, it, I would say I would say it's somewhere in the middle. I wouldn't even have said it was like a lack of hardiness or super hardy. I would have said it's just about average, probably. Um, and so I even lost a tree, a Campanieri tree, one on the west side. This year, I even buried one of the branches in wood chips and it didn't survive. Um, so I'm having really mixed results and it, it just, it's exactly what you just said. There's so many variables. And I think even just where you plant the tree, I mean, you would just have no idea if the fig is hardy, if you're only planting one, it really makes me a little bit sad too, because people who are in this climate and they want to grow figs and they try one, that one may not work out for them. You know, you may give them the hardiest fig in existence and it just won't work. So, um, you know, it kind of is what it is. You just got to kind of get lucky. You got to find the spot. There's something there that's just not clear uh, to us at this moment. Yeah. 
Tell me I more. Mean, we, people haven't been doing this for a long time. I mean, even like you and I got into you know ground culture probably earlier than maybe some. I mean, I, I, I think you couldn't beat Herman. Herman was doing it in 95. But like with all of those years of collecting data and saying like, okay, if you've grown something for 20 years and 15 of those years, boy, they were dynamite figs, but then five, they were, you know, kind of so-so because, well, you got a lot of rain or whatever. Then, you know, the more data that you collect and the longer that you have these things, the more you know what to expect. So when people would be like dumping certain varieties, like, I, I, you know, just, just one that I can think of off the top is like uh, an LSU purple, which, you know, when you first get those figs, they're, they're not good. But if, if you, you know, you wait four or five years and you're, you know, boy, they, you know, they can, they can develop a little more complexity. So it's like not culling your, your, um, your variants. Is that the fig, early. by the way, Bill, that's planted in the front of your house? It is. And that was bad. It was but, bad. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was of, of all of them. That was the worst. Like, I mean, that's like rinse your mouth out kind of bad. Uh -huh. um, but like, I've noticed that it did develop, you know, a little bit more flavor and, you know, it's, it's early it's you know it's but but I, you know I, I wouldn't take it the, the ones that uh, quite honestly and, and I think we touched on this last time um, is that a particular classification of, of figs that like that the, that the restaurants really like that I send to them are the Adriatics and a couple of reasons why visually they're striking of course you know you've got green versus red blood red very you know Visually, it's it's good, um, but also and and a buddy of mine that that grows um, in, with a climate battery, um, he will get figs in that particular climate battery past Christmas, and they're good. And I've found that Adriatic types do not need that heat as much as like a, a Chicago Hardy man. If you get you get some cold cold weather like in, on those fall things, either it will abort, it'll shut down. Or they're just they're they, they're completely yeah they're yeah. they're insipid, but the the Adriatics for whatever reason I think they keep that flavor a little they're not fantastic but they're they're passable and you know so I I, I, I definitely think like you know that particular type you know is 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 kind of a, a, an interesting one for that you know, for sales and so forth. Yeah, we should definitely talk more about varieties. Um, I. Because now I think people get a great understanding of what we're doing instead of just saying, oh, we're doing this. We're trying to pass this information on. Like, I think people now understand, all right, there's mutations. The figs are different. You know, there's obviously not the perfect fig. We're trying to look for that. And now let's talk about some of the figs we found. Um, in terms of the Adriatics, totally would agree with what, what you said. I know we talked about that last time. And it wasn't just you that mentioned this. I think Dan Foster mentioned it to me. I think even Steve Northware mentioned it to me. Um, you know, the, all of us would agree, I think, even Italian 258, they just tend to taste better even when they're underripe. Um, they're acceptable. They're passable. Now, the longer the figs ripen on the tree, the better they're going to taste. I've had some hardy Chicago's in the fall. If you get a Indian summer type fall, where they'll dry on the tree and they'll actually take they'll they will in this dry weather in the fall they'll actually be incredible um some of the best figs i've had believe it or not but as soon like you said as soon as that nighttime temperature or it gets super cold out and and the figs then instead of taking like let's say six or seven days to ripen they'll double that easily but somehow the adriatics and and i think you said last time the italian 58 would would just not really be phased by that and continue producing at the same time they just taste better under right so i've learned to really respect those adriatic figs i'll tell you one real quick that i've been amazed by and i don't know if you've experienced this much you could tell me um is, do they produce brevas for you because i have a prosciutto fig that was found by aaron del monto yeah it's it had like 12 brava on it um, it's in a 15 gallon size pot, but it's only in its third year and it is loaded with main crop. It's loaded with Brava, but I didn't even think they produced that many Bravas. Have, have you seen that? Yeah. I, I, like Adriatic JH, um, I, a couple of winters when it was really mild, they, cause I, you know, I, like, you know, I cut them down 
Um, but like, if you leave a few branches, and I did, um, you know, I had Brava. Um, I, I have kind of a, I, I don't like Brava. I, I don't. And, and I mean, I, and I, until, like, if you can find a Brava that, that is superior to main crop, please let me know. But, uh, so I either, if I knock them off, I mean, they're actually Adriatic Brava, so I, I, like, I had one from uh, Rockaway Green uh, in, in June one time, and that was in a pot. And, and that was good. I mean, I, that was one that I, I wouldn't want to knock off. But then, you know, there are those that are just stealing energy. And, they're, and when they ripen in June, they don't have this, this, this sweetness, you know, at least in my, in my experience. that You know, it's, a, it's an easy loss to just knock them off and, you know, give that energy to the main. Okay. Um, so you, you have seen some, though, that produced uh, Brava. Yeah. I'm, I'm not crazy. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, I don't think it's as heavy as some of the others, but I mean, I and and a lot of the ones that like I have, um, oh, another family would be like um, Atriano, mm -hmm. Doctor Guadio, you know those those guys, Lindhurst White, Medical White, you know those guys. Um, I've had some good brain from them, and they're huge. Yeah, and and that 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 classification, I, I you know I lump them in together as a as a family. There is certainly uh, White Triana, you know, there's certainly ones that are better, yep. um, but but that you know those those Brabas are like they're baseball size. I mean, they can be big. They're um, one of the ones but I they, recommend. But they do. Sorry. But, no, I was gonna say they're one of the ones I recommend for um, people who are looking for Brabas. But yeah, because I mean, and they're like they're really big. I do have, I, in my experience, they 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 do abort a lot. I mean, I like I'll start with a ton of them, and I'm like, ooh, this is gonna be good. And then they just start dropping, and then I'll get, you know, the one the survivors though. Boy, they're like they're they can be good. They can be real good. I see. I have noticed with the in ground figs, if they're producing Brava, they're incredible. I, I had some really nice Brava last year, um, and every year it seems like they get better and taste better. Um, Brava's to me are just such a weird topic. I, I talked a lot about this on my YouTube channel this year, and that there, there's so many weird rules with them. And what even you know even the definition of a Brava like it's just so convoluted it's just it's just not a clear the whole topic i even have smith this is the second year in a row that my smith trees in pots are producing brava and they're ripening Whoa. and wow. um not only are they ripening them but they taste great huh. now i it, the whole thing just is a mystery is it main crop that instead of brava that even though it's forming on last year's growth as the tree wakes up, but is it just a main crop fig that set late in the season last year, and then it just never the, the tree just kind of went to sleep, and it never really decided to all right, well let's let's grow this fig, let's continue the swelling of this, and it just said all right, we'll wait till next season, and now it's growing. I mean, I have a I have two trees I dug up. Well, I dug up dug up one tree in my greenhouse. It's a panache, and it has never fruited in the greenhouse because it's just so shaded in there. Um, and panache, I would argue, seems like it needs a bit more light than other varieties. Um, and so I dug it up, and it was a big espalier, uh, low cordon, just two arms to it. And I chopped off both of the arms and just left the, the main stump. And the stump's probably like three or four years old. Um, dug that up, put it in a container, tried to leave some one-year-old wood from last year, there's a fig that has formed on it and still going strong on that main trunk that's like four years old. How, how does that work? It's not, it's not coming from any growth that existed there. You know, it's not. Yeah, I, I get that a lot. As a matter of fact, early figs are like a Chicago hardy type will grow. Some of the most early growers look like a pimple coming out of the neck of, of the, you know, of the, of the trunk. There's no leaves. There's no, and it's just why. <laughs> and they can be half decent. And some of them are kind of cat faced, where they have kind of like they're they're not they're misshapen. I don't know if that's happened to you, but but they'll just come out right at the side, and it's just bizarre because that fig is just weird looking a lot of times because it's you know internal. It doesn't get the the color change. Like it'll stay like it'll be a Chicago hard type. And it'll be tan, you know, or greenish, but it'll be you know it'll be right. 
mm-hmm. and they're not half bad, but I, it's they're just a kind of an anomaly that's that's really weird that has no leaves, you know, that's just out of the side. Happens a lot, especially early on in the ripening process. Or, you know, earlier than the ones, you know, as it goes bottom to top, it's just it's they're just bizarre, and I and I don't I don't know what to make of them really. Yeah, it's a, again, it's such a weird topic. Um, now, if I actually really value Brabus nowadays, I didn't value them at all. I would take them off just like you, and then somehow my Smith just kept producing Braba. Um, this year, I even have some Hatib de Argentil Brabas. I've had some really nice Juale Noir Braba. Um, you know, certain varieties. Um, th- this prosciutto, the Adriatics, if they do produce Braba, are actually quite good. Um, you know, the, I had a long to oot Braba last year. It was incredible. Um, you know, same thing with uh, um, Moro de Caneva. They're they're exceptional, especially on the in ground figs. So, I mean, that's not always possible for you and I. It's just a bonus. And I had some trees this year where they woke up and they looked like they were going to produce like 20, 25 Braba, and then most of them, if not all of them, fell off. Um, you know, I have a friend in Jersey who has the same long to oot tree as, tree as me. Uh, his is in, he's in 7B though, and so he's just in a slightly warmer place as just the coast of Jersey is. Um, and his long to oot has Brava on it. They're massive. Um, whereas mine produced what looked like 25 Brava, and then almost all of them, I think, I think I'm almost certain all of them fell off. Um, and so I don't have any. Even though my tree has zero dieback whatsoever, it, it, performed like a champ this winter time and what why is that happening you know someone brought up to me well ross what's the difference between the hardiness rating of the brabas versus the hardiness rating of the wood i didn't have an answer for him (laughs) do you have an answer because i to me it seems like I almost I thought that they were the same hardiness because if the branch is going to survive wouldn't the brabas survive Right. Maybe you could argue it's one or two degrees of a difference, but uh, I mean, uh, the whole thing just is crazy. Now, if the if the criteria is I have to have a Braba that's in a in in the ground and in an in ground tree, I would love that. But if I have to have them and I can only get them in containers, well, then I'm probably not going to get great quality and they're going to be kind of few and far between. Sometimes I've seen a lot of them will just drop off if we get a little bit of a cold spell. Even the in-ground figs, they seemingly, you just get this cold night and it just zaps the trees a little bit. Um, and they're like, all right, well, I guess maybe I'm sleeping now. And then they drop all their Brava. Um, so I don't know. I don't know where I stand on that. If you have any thoughts, go ahead. But I also want to hear... I, the, I, like, I'm not very educated. I, you know, I wouldn't be the person that... Because I... Like I have, I have my mind set on you know what I want to do, and the fact that I they're limited for me anyway because just because I chop wood they grow unless I miss a branch and sometimes I, like that's happened to me on EBTs like some English brown turkey types where I've gotten and they can be bizarre looking by the way like uh, the Bravo on an EBT I, like I have a picture of a chia petta, um and it it looks like inhuman like it, it's just it it's it it's crooked it's, it's just like the thing that you wouldn't want to put in your mouth but it you know it was it was good and i but I, like i just i don't know much other than that you know i i usually just trim them because mm-hmm. i'm i'm always thinking main crop um and and i mean i i wish i was more curious like like you i just I, i'm i guess i'm just like hey the main crop is what what counts, and like when some people are like, you know, I mean, and, I, and I'm kind of a jerk that way because when people ask, they're like, "Hey, do you have Desert King?" and I'm like, "No, why would I?" You know, like, but but they can be good, you know. They, you know, that's you know, your San Pedro, yeah, um, Granum's Royal, stuff like that. You know, they they can, you know, they can be good, but for me, it's like if that's all I'm gonna get, I, you know, yeah, th- this was all I really. Um... A really recent realization because the other part of this is that not only are they bravas and it's you know that whole thing but you can now pollinate them yeah you can hand pollinate and so that's something i think in the future all of us are probably going to be doing i I would be shocked if 
if all of us weren't at some point that are really serious about this, this is going to throw a wrench in everything coming up. I, I hope this season I can throw a wrench in everything is that if you pollinate a couple figs on every tree, you compare the pollinated ones versus what you know they taste like. And if they're just jumping up in flavor to an extraordinary level and well then maybe if you have like a fig like Iranian candy or let's say Teramo that doesn't taste that great or I mean I'm sure they, they can I, I actually like Teramo but if they they're definitely not the best tasting fig but if you can take a fig like Teramo that's extremely arty you know very early and is then going to now have this amazing flavor component well now you just took an average or above average fig and made it insanely good so I, I can't wait for that to try every single fig and just see what happens with all the good ones I have, at least the ones that perform well. And then the other thing to consider is, well, when you pollinate it, it's going to change in size. It's going to swell a little bit different. It's probably going to split a little bit more. So you're going to change the the performance. And would the pollination benefits of the flavor outweigh the benefits of you know, the production problem that you're now creating? Um, or the quality pr uh, problem that you're creating. Um, so there, I have a feeling, even though I have this list of my favorite figs, and you you do too, I think it's going to change probably pretty dramatically coming up here. I mean, if you can take a Celeste and pollinate that and have it taste incredible, you know, then what? Yeah. Which then makes yeah. me think almost in a way, I'm like, I'm like, wait, now I have to go back and reacquire every fig I've ever tried to then pollinate it and see what the deal is, you know? Like yeah. it, um, I don't know. It, it's a little bit of a rabbit hole there. Yeah. Yeah, I find that to be the case, you know, with with everything. Like, we, you know, we talked about, um, the, you know, the Chicago Hardy types, but um, you brought it up kind of, and I'm thinking, like, you could, you could go ape on Celeste. And Celeste variants, mm -hmm. you know, from you know, Black Blue, um, you know, some of those the, the so-called Mega Celeste, and um, the one that Lou Monty's got, you know, on Chicotique, the Chicotique um, Celeste, which you know I think is is bigger, um, and it's got more of a berry component to it. So it's like all of these things, whether pollinated or unpollinated, but just genetic drift or whatever you want to call it, it's just like. You know, I'm a lumper. I think you are too. When you, you know, because you, you could say at least they're in a family. You know, there's there's not too many outliers really. Um, but then within that, once you've got them lumped, there's you know, like you said, there's a hierarchy and all these things, whether pollinated or unpollinated. Um, I just find it fascinating of just just all all the variations. I mean, just take incredible. black celeste. I mean, if you did a genetic test of all these celeste figs. I would be I would not be surprised that they all were the same genetically, but yep. that black celeste was a mutation of some celeste tree somewhere. And now it's black. Now the 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 flesh is like dark red. It tastes like Violet de Bordeaux, it tastes like blueberries rather than, you know, tasting like some sugar fig. Yeah. Um it's it, yeah, it's amazing. Um yeah. what, and I mean like you like you said, you know, through genetic testing and you find out, okay, yeah, that's the same. They're I, I got to believe, though, that there's other variables, you know, that are measurable or un immeasurable. I mean, it, 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 it's it's hard to argue, just as if, you you know, when, when you do taste like a red Lebanese Becca Bali, and then, you know, and then you taste a, a Chicago Hardy, like a standard Chicago Hardy, and it's just like, they may come out and, you know, have that same, same uh, fingerprint, but there's something measurable or immeasurable about it that that suggests that you know they're they're different. And what you know, I think that's why we're always on this we're always on this hunt, you know, for you know finding that so-called perfect fit or finding just a new variant of something that's pre-existing. What if you had you know because you you and I have tried a number of Hardy Chicago figs. Let's say there was a mutation of a hardy Chicago that occurred that enabled it that when it was pollinated to taste incredible, you know, how do I know that every hardy Chicago, the hundred or whatever, how many there are, how do I know when I hand pollinate them that they're actually not they're that they're not going to change much in flavor. You know, historically 
a lot of the people that live in California and they have the fig wasp and they've been able to experiment with this more, they've come to conclusions about certain varieties, then they know that, well, there's just a list of, let's say, 20 varieties or so many varieties that really change once you pollinate them. And Hardy Chicago is not on that list. But what if there was one Hardy Chicago that yeah. did? Without shine. Yeah, without shine. The others, for whatever reason, it leveled up where some of the other ones just, just wouldn't. I hope I mean, that never happens. It's, it's possible. I mean, it's... I, we, would, we would lose our minds. We would never... Yeah. We could never stop. I mean, you really could never stop. Because then you'd be yeah. like, all right, well, what about the Celeste I found? That By the way, I was in Cape May Point not too long ago. Never been to Cape May Point. There's fig trees everywhere. And it's old. It's historic. It's not developed. Um, and a lot of them are Celeste. And I've found on the Jersey Shore in particular, there is a larger Celeste that, uh, that exists there and somehow is in a higher quantity than other Celeste figs. Um, so I have one actually from Ocean City, New Jersey. But in, in Cape May uh, Point, um, you know, I actually came across in this recent trip, like what was about four or five trees just on one street that looked actually rather unique compared to anything I've ever seen. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, anyway, so yeah, there, there's a lot, a lot to this. What about um, some of the figs you do at least, should we even talk about the figs you cur we currently like? Because if they're going to change, what's the point, right? Yeah, yeah this, will be, this will be dated in about a year, you know? Because I mean, well, look, it, it happened to me, you know, when I was, Preaching about Ronde Bordeaux at the time, that's what I felt. Well, what don't I, you like I, about Ronde Bordeaux now? Um, this is, again, I don't have a, a, like, my sample size is probably four or five in-ground trees and three potted Ronde Bordeaux. For, and, and, I, and by the way, I, I remember 2012 is when they, when they made it here. And I remember wanting to get it so bad, and they were super expensive. Well, expensive at the time, you know, for cuttings, it was like, I mean, it, it, we laugh about it now, but like for like, and they would sell it. They wouldn't sell it per cutting. This is eBay. You sell it for like four or five cuttings, and you're like fifty bucks, and they're like, that's crazy. Nobody's gonna pay that. Look at us now. But I, I think like in my sample size and 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 the years that I've grown it, um, my only qualm. Well, I have two qualms with. Number one, in the ground, um, I find it to be a splitter. Like, it's very rare. I'm not saying that when splitting, we should differentiate splitting from souring, you know, because things can split without souring. Um, but it, it's almost always a splitter. So it loses that beauty that, it, you know, because it, it's a striking fig. I mean, it really, that almost jet black, you know, sometimes you get blown on it. Um, that, that, um, that appearance is really nice. The splitting, I, I don't love, and at least, and this could be my palate, my palate only, I get like a grassy aftertaste that I don't like. And I don't re remember that having that, but I mean, that's not one tree doing that for me. That's every one. And maybe it's psychological. It's like, oh, this is going to have that bad grassy aftertaste. But I, but it's, from, it went from having that nice raspberry-ish kind of complexity that I, I really enjoyed to, you know, I, I, I certainly would call it an above average fit still with, with the, you know, the, the criteria that I had about it, it being splitter and, and having a bit of an aftertaste. Um, I, that's, that's, that's where I am now, I guess, is that instead of a, you know, it being like the upper echelon, I find it to be above average. That's, that's it. So Bill, um, <laughs> let me ask you more about your Ronde Bordeaux trees. I'm just, I'm really curious. Um, the ones in containers, you don't really prune them that much, I assume. Um, no, they're, and they're better. And, and it, which is weird because I would always say, and I still believe this to be almost a hundred percent is that you grow an in-ground tree, especially in our area, with the correct nutrients that you don't have to play, you know, uh, mad scientist where you're adding NPK, adding, you know, water, making your water dripper, uh, you know, sip, well, however the device. Um, I, I would say that 90% of all the figs that I grow in the ground are superior to anything in a pot. Um, just because it's, 
it's it's at that balance. It's that's the way that you know things are supposed to be grown in my opinion. Um, but but being able to play mad scientist allows you the freedom to restrict water and do some things that you can't really. It's a, t it's a lot tougher to, to mess around with with in ground culture. So I think that um, in in that case, for whatever reason, I, I don't pick up. You know, they don't split as often typically, and they don't um, they don't have such a, a, a the aftertaste is much subtler. Or so, so. Just a little bit more digging around here. The the in-ground trees, though, they die back in the wintertime or they're pruned really hard. And they're they're kind of yes. coming up from the suckers and then they're yeah. fruiting on the suckers. So this is what I learned. This was an observation that I made, and I, I think this is true, in that, you know, obviously everything I say, we you don't know if 100% certain it's true, but this is what I noticed, at least, with a lot of the in-ground figs I had. Um, and some people bring up the argument of, well, and you, I think you may have even mentioned this, that over time of them being planted in the ground, they just get better and they just become more mature. And you brought up the root system thing. Now that could have been the case of what had occurred. So that's an alternative. But what I'm no, what I noticed last season, because we had a mild winter, um, for two winters in a row. Uh, a number of my in-ground figs were able to survive the winter time without any dieback, and so and then instead of fruiting on their on the suckers, uh, they were fruiting on again a structure that existed like like a potted fig, um, or like any other tree that wasn't grown in some really cold place, and the fruit I noticed was just different. Um, I told you this, and maybe it was over text or maybe the last time we talked. But the long to oot, as an example, was the where I was I was ready to get rid of it because <laughs> it was so big that it would split every single time, and I and it was attracting so many fruit flies, and I just couldn't 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 do it. Just as, you know, and then then last year, it survived the winter, and the figs were about half the size, the tree was more productive, and the figs tasted like cotton candy. Like, I'm not kidding. There was a sugar flavor in there. Uh, you know, some of them are like honey or syrupy or like, like let's say maple syrup or some other sugar flavor. They tasted like cotton candy. Um, and I think the only real reason that was is because when you have the suckers that come up from the base, they have so much photosynthesis that they produce because their leaves are massive they're just growing like crazy and they typically have so much surface area of those leaves that they produce way more photosynthesis than if they had a permanent structure to the tree and so all that energy is being directed into the fruits that form on those suckers so as it continues to grow you just end up having these giant fruits that are that are frankly very different than what you would normally see and I think they improve in quality. And the one reason you could at least make a conclusion on that is obviously is the size. Um, so the size, as you know, in humid places, and especially with splitting, if you have the, the fruits expand too quickly, they tend to split. A fig can only be so big without splitting. And also, the, typically, the smaller they are, the easier it is for the water to sort of evaporate out of the fruit and for it to dry on the tree. They, they concentrate better. They just typically taste better. They're of higher quality. You know, people, I've always been the, the guy that loves the smaller figs, but I think there is some truth to that. Um, now, there might be some other things, like this grassy flavor that you're picking up. Um, if, if you're not picking that up in the potted figs, maybe that could be it, but... I'm not 100% certain on that, but what I am what could tell you with certainty, I I believe, is that it's definitely changing the size of the, shape, the the figs. It's changing then the quality of the figs, and it's also going to change how frequently they split. Uh, and so a fig for me, actually, Ron de Bordeaux, is so surprised for you to say that because it did. I, I would actually have thought years, a couple years ago that it was not great, but if it did split, I noticed that it was still holding up somehow to the elements and then it had this great ability even though it's split to continue ripening without souring without 
um, having a problem, and it was actually pretty good. But last year, the splitting and even the year before that was significantly less. Um, this Rondé Bordeaux tree I have, but I wrapped it this season, uh, is probably going to produce 300 figs like that Campanieri tree I, I talked about. If you come here, um, I invited you to a tasting, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, if you come, there's going to be Rondé, plenty of Rondé Bordeaux to try, and I'd be curious to see what you have to say about it. Yeah, I'm, I would love that because, you know, I want to believe that, you know, I wasn't an idiot back then that said, like, oh, this is great. And, then, you know, that now I'm backpedaling a little bit on that. But, um, you know, I I would love to get a different sample and see if what you're saying, you know, holds water because I think I'm because it's very interesting because I'm, I'm thinking the way that I grow trees is, is not your average. And so some of my data is not what you know, what m- most growers would find when, when you're chopping it down the, you know, the stump almost. Yep. So, so I, you know, I think the, the data that I'm collecting is a little bit different and not, not typical. Yep. So that's why I, 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 I'd like to be wrong. And I think that that, that is very possible. And I'd, I'd love to, love to check that out and see if I, you know, cause if the one thing that's, a, that's, that's not a variable is my mouth. So if I can, if I, if I am not picking up that flavor, then that's that's not me on that particular day. That's just you know, hey, it's, it doesn't contain this off flavor, and it's and it has probably something to do with the, the fact that it's not that vegetative, you know, that combative kind of thing where where that establishment can get the figs to you know to ripen properly and, and have that good carbohydrate. Um, it, it is wow. very interesting because you know it's not like someone's you're not it's not like you're doing it wrong like you said you're backpedaling I, I don't think you're backpedaling at all I think what you're doing is very successful and actually extremely difficult to do what you're doing because getting them to fruit from the suckers is nearly impossible here you know I can get some decent results but I just wasn't seeing good success so I had to make a pivot you know just because my yard I know you your yard you got light pretty much sun up to sun down and that's a big difference right there in actually getting the suckers to fruit in my opinion at least um because yeah, i'm i'm mine's mine's late like when people are saying oh i'm getting figs and and i, and I say well i'm not yet yeah you're not how, how are you not and it's like well mine have been starting from i mean it's not like we're starting yeah. on even even base here you know i'm at a disadvantage and i know that and and like sometimes just because i'm you know a scientist that's you know i i, I gotta not do that on a few just to see yep. that yep. that variation and i'll tell you something with the the one that i did was you know i pruned my rock away i had a smaller rock away that, that was in the front yard that i didn't prune and like i was getting production i'm like man i wish i didn't have to cut mine to the stump yeah. because you know i yeah. wish i wasn't so greedy <laughs> because you know the flavor because i mean those rockaways were great they, they ripened early mm-hmm. they beat that like in the northeast it seems like we have this period of time and it's usually late august to sometime in september where we'll get the remnants of a, of a hurricane or at least like some really heavy rain yep. and if you can ripen before that happens you know they can be tremendous you know and then you got to wait till that dry out process before they get good again um because i like i know for restaurant quality like if like i'll sample it and if it's not if it's insipid because like just like a tomato, like we've had this rain, it dr- just drowns out the flavor. I, I won't, I won't bring it. You know, I'll just, I'd rather just, I'd rather people not get a bad opinion. That's what, that's what kills me, by the way, about when people are like, when I meet the very rare person that they're like, yeah, you got figs. Oh, I don't like figs. And I'm like, no, I'm not talking about fig newtons. And they're like, no, I'm not talking about fig newtons either. I'm talking about fresh figs. I'm like, we got them at Whole Foods, didn't you? Yeah. You got them from <laughs> California, didn't you? Yeah. Well, you know, that's, that you know when they're they're not picking them at the right time i don't want them to have a bad experience because if they have a bad experience and they like with my figs they're then they're never going to eat a fig again and so i don't want to ruin it like whole foods is real i don't want to ruin it like you know some of these places that just they'll import they'll pick super early because they're like well i don't want the fig to spoil well you know that's not good either but when you're picking them way early when they've got sap coming you know off the tops of them when you're picking them you know, there's been, you're not going to have a good experience. Bro. Yeah, I mean, the model's broken, isn't it? I mean, it's basically, it, the, the fig could be like the next avocado. It's so close to being the next avocado if they would just do it right. If someone yeah. would actually grow the figs, you get them locally, 
and you taste them right off the tree, you're, you, you would just lose your mind. You're like, I got to have an avocado every day, you know? Right. Um, yeah, like, like the one chef, he's like, he's like, I, I like your figs. They're delicious, but they're, they're a little wrinkly. And I'm like, <laughs> yep, yep. They're, they're going to be, cause I'm not bringing ones that aren't, you know, I'm not bringing ones that are, you know, super hard and, and yeah. sip it. I'm, you know, I, you, in order to get the good experience, it, it, I always say like, if, if you think it's ripe, you want to pick it, wait, mm-hmm. wait another day, wait another day. And you know, it's, it's just like the incredible flavors that appear that, that were not there, that will not be there if you pick them, you know, when they're ripe. Um, it, it's that development of complexity is night and day and appearance isn't everything. It's just, it really is, is worth the wait. That's, I'm so glad that you encourage people to just, you know, to create that. I, I think you may have coined it as a hang time because, uh-huh. because it really is like, it's so important. It's like, don't wait for color change. Color change is, is that's part of it, but it's not done. Right. You know? Yeah. It is the most important uh, characteristic any fig variety can have in this climate and any, in any human climate. I find um, if the fig is just hanging on the tree too long, you're just something's going to happen. The hurricane's going to come in. The rain's going to come in. You're going to lose that quality. Um, to just to go back a little bit to what you were saying about the Ronde Bordeaux and um, how the the figs are ripening later. Um, that somebody was saying, "Oh, you're getting figs now." I was get, I've been getting figs or whatever. You know, I think it's the same exact thing. Again, you like you said, they're coming up from the base and they're just producing later. Um, by preserving those apical and lateral buds, it's just magic. It's just amazing why they can even just fruit earlier because of that. Um, yeah, I would love to, uh, you know, I've been to your place before. I, I have really never invited almost anybody here, even though I make so many videos and whatnot. But um, it would be cool if you can come by and we could obviously exchange um, thoughts on different things. But um, what I do want to say is that – the whole process of, you know, chopping these trees down every year is such an awesome thing. You know, it's hard to go away from that <laughs> because, I mean, I don't know about you, Bill, but I sell about 1,500 cuttings every year. Um, and I'm sure you're selling quite a bit to different people. I know you have a sale every year. I mean, you got the, the fig tree sale right now that's going on. It's hard to, like, go away from that. What I've decided to do just to throw this at at you a little bit is I'll cut all the suckers and all the other growth down except for one. And then that one I'll protect. And then that becomes the tree and it becomes rather actually a rather small, slow growing tree. The trick is from there getting the suckers to continue growing, even though there's this dominance and that can be difficult. Um, and I'm kind of sorting through that right now, but, uh, I think that hybrid method is probably the way to go. Like to, to be able to experience like really good figs, um, but yet be able to, you know, make, you know, get your cuttings out and, and, and make sure that they get distributed. But yeah, I think the hybrid method is something I should really look into because it's like, it's absolutely worth it. I mean, because it, you can't really get a good perspective if you, if you chop the whole thing off, you know, and you can't really get a good perspective if you, if you leave every, all the growth on anyway, you know, with all the competition. So, you know, I think that, that hybrid method would be the way to, that I think I'm going to probably do because um, it's it's very simple to just do the just the layover, you know, throw whatever wood chips or whatever on the on the top of it just to preserve one. Right. Yeah. Exactly. You don't even have to preserve uh, something really tall. That was the other realization I had. Th- this happened last year where I was like, I I had two suckers from an LSU Huye tree that were about a foot and a half tall. They were really thin and they survived the winter time somehow. I was like, how did these little suckers survive? I was just blown away. I was like, they, there's no way they're lignified that well. It was just crazy to me, but they made it through. And then on those suckers, I made a point to see if those, if those would fruit and they did. Yeah. And then I was like, all right, well, if these suckers are going to fruit and they're fruiting on those apical and lateral buds, just on the sucker, the sucker itself, can I do the same thing with all these other branches that I then bent over this past winter? And, and the answer was yes. Across the board, almost every tree that did survive and has those apical and lateral buds is in that right balance, and it's, it's actually fruiting. 
Uh, most of the early varieties will probably fruit the very end of July, beginning of August this year. And um, it's probably, this is the best season I've ever had. I, I had access to a commercial greenhouse this year um, and I had every single potted fig for the most part in that greenhouse and they taken off and they're probably going to fruit a month earlier than they, they normally do. But even if I took out every single potted fig I have, which is, you know, you, you've, I'm sure you're dealing with similar numbers of like a hundred figs or whatever. And I got rid of those. The in-ground figs would still be so amazing of the production that I'm going to see this year that, I, that I'm like, this is the best season yet. And it's just the simple fact that they survived. I protected a number of the branches. They're in that right balance and, and it just is working out. Um, you know, it almost makes me think too, that I just feel like so, if you can protect them for that first year and then get them to slow down and grow from that, that prior wood uh, of the apical and lateral buds, they may end up lignifying really well. They will lignify better um, the next season because, because they're growing so slowly, they're in that balance, they actually will do what they're, they're supposed to do. And and I don't I'm curious to see what would even happen with the hardiness, because now that they're lignified and they're not these super you know they they'll grow you you've, I've seen your house they grow even, even bigger and, and faster than mine, well they'll be like you know inches off the ground and then they're going to be 15 feet tall, um, you know that that's never really going to survive the winter it's just maybe a portion of it would um, and I'm sure you've seen that a lot but. Um, the only real way to, I think, get this to, to work for us is to somehow get it to survive early on and then, then go from there. Um, yeah. I think slowing down, I think like, oh, I mean, Herman sort of introduced me to it is that is the pinching, you know, and I mean, at that point, either it's going to make a fig litter or a branch and so forth, but doing that early, trying to s slow that process down maybe in like August. I think you're right. I think that it will add to the hardiness because if it's got, I always call it its winter jacket. It gets winter jacket on when it lignifies. The earlier it does that, the more, the heavier the winter jacket is. And, you know, and I think that that, that certainly helps. And, and one one in particular that I have, I have Niagara Black, which is still a young tree, and I've kept my mouth wide, you know, shut on this. Uh, but, I mean, I have it in a non-ideal, you know, spot. And, it's an LDA variant, obviously. I mean, I've got Nordland and I've got um, Pellegrino of, of all fairly similar, you know, DNA. And, you know, this, for whatever reason, it's a slow grower. And that slow growing, I'm telling you, I mean, I like, it's got figlets on it already. And I can't say that about any of mine yet. I mean, they're getting close, but, but like that is about, it's it's super far ahead and it has less dieback and it's a younger tree so why would that be you know it's got a poor location at least in terms of of um of sunlight um i don't know but i i think what you're saying makes a lot of sense and i mean it's this is we're just you know anecdotal stuff right now but i mm -hmm. think like the longer it goes and the more the years go on and we collect more data on this i, I think you're on to something well, I, I appreciate that. I, I just, even if I'm not onto something, it, it doesn't really matter either way, either philosophy, because, you know, we just want to do something different. I mean, that's the name of the game is to see, well, what if I do that? You know, what happens if, if this happens? We, we're not doing these super scientific experiments, and we don't ever really know for sure. But at the end of the day, even what you're doing or even what I did for many years of cutting them back, from you know 10 foot tall trees to almost nothing and then selling those cuttings is it's a great thing to do um and a lot of people want these cuttings and by the way they're great cuttings <laughs> those cuttings that are from those suckers man they make such great cuttings they always root people love them they're thick yeah. um I, I mean i think that i think that thickness thing can't be understated because i i believe that you know, those skinny cuttings, some people like them. I mean, some people, and they shoot out fast. I don't disagree. Like their, their dormancy time is short and you're waiting forever on those logs. But when those logs take off and they will, and it's, and by the way, it's hard to, to rot them out. 
Yep. Because they, you know, they, they're a little more resistant. They can take that a little bit more. But I, I, I much prefer like a nice like magic marker size, you know, cutting or even a little bigger, knowing that it's full of energy. Mm-hmm. And you know, those suckers that come out. I mean, they're they're vigorous. Like, so why wouldn't they, right? Like, why wouldn't they do real well? They they want to survive. Like, I always think of the, you know, this, as we train big trees and so forth, I, I know if you don't stress them out, like, if you don't pinch, if you don't do any of that stuff, why does it need to make fruit? It's fine. It can grow vegetatively. It's less energy. You know, it's it's like, what, you know, you're when you cause, just like when you callous them or, or, or when you score, you know, they get to cause that, you're causing stress. When you do the same thing with air layering, you're causing stress. It has to start throwing out roots because it's it, it wants to survive. So I, I always think that those like spindly little ones, you know, they're eh, there's no not much energy in them. There's not a lot of stress. I and and stressing figs out, especially as cuttings, when you restrict that water, you know, they have to find it. Like you keep them nice and wet, and they're like, oh, I, you know, they want to be, you know, they kill them with kindness kind of thing. Like, I feel like you really want there to be stress. Mm. If there's no stress, there's, there's you know, no hormonal response. Totally agree. Totally agree. I mean, and there's even that, you know, stress that's from um, when they're, you know, fruiting. Obviously, there's less water. They're going to taste better. I mean, that was the mm-hmm. whole thing with that plot I have out in the front. Um, you know, something uh, else just – just for food for thought is that I'm, I'm even going to keep pruning some trees. You know, I may even just have tree. I planted trees in the ground just to, just so I can prune them. You know, like I got some trees that I'm going to dedicate or these are for fruiting. And and then these are for actually just taking cuttings. Like, like we just talked about, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, and if anything, I think it's a, it's a good thing to do. You want to be able to spread these varieties around. Um, And of course it's part of our business. So, um, you know, I planted a cavalier tree in the ground. It's definitely one of my favorite figs. Um, I don't know how well it's going to do in the ground. I'm curious to see if it will split less now that I've planted in the ground. But if it doesn't perform well, doesn't make it as one of those varieties in this climate, then whatever. I'll just keep pruning it and sell cuttings because guess what? It's just one of the best tasting and one of the better figs you can have. So, you know, I I even took the approach this year of planting things like, you know, Parajal Ramada and Martinenka Ramada, even though they probably have no shot at ever really beating a fig like, let's say, Celeste or or Hardy Chicago, just so that I could obtain more wood from these and uh, dedicate those trees to, you know, varieties that that should be spread around. I mean, that's the that's the goal. Once you find, yeah, I think that there's more than just you know, there's collectors out there that. They, you know, they don't want to put them in the ground. They, you know, they want healthy wood to prop, to propagate so that they can grow them in a pot and they're very happy with that. And they, you know, certain collectors want just these unique, I call them bou- uh, bouquet, or, or the, like, like the, um, what do you call it? The fig packs? They're, they're, I'm sorry? The packs of cuttings you're talking about? No, like uh, the ones that are, are like, they're, you know, high-end boutique kind of things. That's what I'm going for. Collector like, items? Where, you know, that's, that's what they want. But then there are those, like you mentioned with the packs, that are like, no, I want to grow fruit that I can eat. And I don't want it to look pretty necessarily. And I don't want it to be so I can it's super photogenic so I can get you know, yeah. all these things on Instagram. They, like they, they want results. They want workhorse. They want, you know, utility figs. So I think there's a, there's a market for all these people. But I think like the biggest thing that I, that I try to do is just be honest and say like, hey, I mean, my website's terrible because it says, like, this is not good for the Northeast. Well, that's a, that's a heck of a pitch, you know, like, we're going to sell a lot there. But I, but I, but it doesn't mean that, like, down south, like in Texas or, or California or whatever, that it wouldn't be stupendous, like, that it would be exactly the criteria for what someone would be looking for in those areas. You know, yeah, it's absolutely. just that, that, like, for me, I, I, I like to highlight the, um, you know, the ones that are early, that are hardy and that are, you know, that taste pretty good, you know, and those are, are not the sexiest names and they don't have, you know, they, their, their lineage is just like unknown Owensboro or, you know, or something like that. Well, you know, that doesn't sound super appealing, but, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of performance, some of those are tough to beat. 
Um, I have a couple questions for you, actually. I two thoughts. I was like, tell me about this Randino fig. I know you said that you liked it. Um, and then you also, um, I was like, at what point, even though it's unknown Owensboro, you know, at what point, if it does become like a really, really great fig and it's, let's say, close to your perfect fig, at what point do you just give it a name? You know what I mean? Like, is that a thing that you would ever consider? I, I would never do it um, because I, I even did this when, I, I, if you recall, and I know you do, it's like when uh, Ben's Golden Riverside became uh, Rainbow something. Golden Rainbow, yeah. Golden Rainbow, yeah, okay, right. So, I mean, same thing, but like, I'm going to call it what I got it as because I want to keep, keep, you know, I just don't want to, like, for a while, um, I forget what... Uh, what Iranian candy was called, but that had a name. And then that Rasty's changed. unknown. Yeah. Yeah. Rasty, there you go. Yeah. And, and um, I, I just feel like, even though it's not a cool sounding name necessarily or whatever, it's like, that is, you know, that's how I got it. So I, I really was sluggish in making that change that, you know, the name, because I felt like, yeah, it's the same thing. But I, I also didn't want to cause more confusion with more names of the same fig and, yeah. And that, that that kind of drives me nuts. But like, and I, I like Owensboro, and I and I think um, it has a kind of an interesting uh, flavor profile. But for me, you know, that's just what I got it as, and that's you know you can follow that back to I think Bill uh, Saxon Fig or, or something like that. I think that he he may have found that um, back way back back when. And I just try to keep everything. I mean, the only thing that I think I've ever really changed. Um, ever was Taramo. I called it unknown Taramo. And at the time, I mean, since that, since then, we we found ones that are that are similar, Nevo and some of those other ones. Um, uh, but but like I, it had enough of a uniqueness that a lot of people dropped the unknown and just called it Taramo. And that's that's you know how it came. That's I think what like One Green World they're selling it now. And I'm like, thanks for the shout. Oh yeah! By the way, they didn't mention you. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, how do you like, feel about people like One Green World actually selling these varieties and stuff? I, I always say, like, if you buy something from me, it's yours. You can do whatever you want with it. You know, that's not my property anymore. It's yours. Yeah. You know, so I, as much as I would have loved to, at least just a mention on the website, perhaps. Um, yeah. Uh, that would be cool, but um, there's a link or something. But you know, who's going to read that? Uh, but, but like. Um, yeah, I, I, I always feel like, you know, if somebody, you know, somebody wants to sell what I've sold them, it's now theirs. So I don't like, or why did, you know, they should have not sold that because I don't want them to, or I want to sell it all. You know, I just, I, I just don't think that that belongs to anybody. And I, you know, I'm glad that Terramo is distributed as much as it is. I'm, I'm very glad that, you know, it's made, it's rounds and some people really enjoy it. I'm glad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's how I feel about it too. I actually think I had in my my head for the last couple of years that I was going to give to some nursery. I, I wasn't sure who exactly. I really like Edible Landscaping. I love the people at Edible Landscaping, Michael yeah. McConkey, the staff there. There's a guy named George I really like. Um, and then also there's um, Lucille uh, Whitman at Whitman Farms. I really like talking to her one time. Um you know, One Green World strikes me as good people too. I just never really talked to them. The the w- woman at um, uh, Honeyberry USA reached out to me about one of my Honeyberry videos and had nice things to say. So I, I've always thought, you know, maybe I should take some couple varieties that really you don't, no one really has here or still quite rare, and make them available to the public. I mean. That was actually something I think f- maybe there was a thread on our figs many years ago about just fruits and exotics acquiring a couple figs and what figs we thought they should acquire so that they could make them available to the public. And, you know, my first thought was, well, what about the cold and alms? I mean, no one really was selling the cold and alms outside of someone like you and I that was really into figs. So it, it only makes sense that I feel like these nurseries get a hold of them. My only gripe is we shouldn't just be giving them every single fig, or they shouldn't be growing every single fig in existence. I think there's a ton, I know there's a ton of uh, 
irresponsible information all over the internet about figs. And it's a lot of it's in nursery catalogs. I mean, they're just yeah. regurgitated, uh, incorrect information over yeah. and over and over. And you're just like, yeah. how, how do these people not do their research and at least come information to... and also pictures? Like the pictures don't matter. Like the pictures are not. Oh the, my! Not the same thing, and it drives me nuts because you know you're you're selling these things and you're and you don't know your product. Like how don't you know your product? You don't know your product. Because I, I, I can tell you that like this was way back when I started Bell Flair, like Bell Flair Nursery. You know, they had they had everything. And I still am trying to get some of their collection um, to, to at least get that because some of it got lost a little bit and and it was I, like I know Pete um and Derry. And I was, yes. Um, you know, he's he's preserved a lot of those. So, you know, that legacy is restored thanks to him, you mm-hmm. know, to, to the most part. But but I think like they had it and, you know, there, there was very few nurseries and, and even still, like if you go to Lowe's, like they'll, and it, you know, or Home Depot and that, if they have three varieties, you know what they are, you know, but they might not. And, and I've checked the leaves and I'm like, this is mislabeled. That's mislabeled, you know, and they don't know like they, because they don't know their product. And if you ask them, Hey, where should I grow this fig tree? I mean, they might tell you what my mom told me of growing it in the shade, you know, they, because they don't know. Right. Um, like this is a this is a niche market what we're dealing with this is a niche fruit that is is blowing up thank goodness and you know it's, it's gaining a lot of popularity it's a lot of popularity and you know, uh, you know the the tv food network and i mean they're, they're using fig they, like more and more products. recipes out there using figs fresh figs and preserve you know just they're they're, they're getting to be they're getting to be a very uh versatile uh, addition to a lot of lot of few dishes that they never were before. Yeah, I, that's why I've been hesitant to give some of these varieties, like let's say Campaneri or Moro de Caneva, to one of these nurseries. I mean, if they buy it from me, that so be it. They could do whatever they want, like you said. But I don't want somebody to go on these websites that's looking for this variety and they're just mislabeled. I mean, how many times has that happened to me? plenty of times even from my favorite nursery edible landscaping it, it happens you know um even from uh rain tree nurseries probably the most problematic of, of them all that i've had experience with even though you know no shots against them i i do enjoy their nursery and i respect their nursery but it's just uh, it's just too irresponsible if i could find someone who was actually passionate about these figs and really cared about them and would actually have a product like you said that you know, it's not going to be, uh, you know, the wrong variety and they're going to actually know where it comes from and actually be able to say, hey, by the way, this guy Bill Loris in Lancaster found Teramo and we're selling it. You know, here's the link to his website. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like if you're not going to be responsible, then I, I, I just can't see it. But I've, I've always like the goal is to is and still is with all the cuttings I sell and all the plants I sell. I want these varieties to go to the masses. You know, it's just so much harder to do when I'm just one person or when you're one person. Um, and I, if you believe in it, especially if you believe in it, like Teramo, you know, it belongs to be in people's yards. So, um, you know, is it above and beyond, or let's say any variety, is this variety above and beyond others? Well, it should be if, right. If we're going to be making it available as much as we do, um, uh, which is, I even take a little bit of, a a stance on if if it's actually a really bad fig i will not sell it I, right. i've done that a number of times where tried a variety said you know what i don't even think anybody should grow this fig let me just yeah. let me just dump this so that way there's no chance that even somebody could pr- like proliferate this um yeah i don't know um yeah i've had some that i that I, they're like you, you don't carry that i'm like i don't like it you know I, just like i just like i would drop you know certain other fruits that you know that I don't enjoy. Like I didn't grow black currants forever, and uh, people would ask at, at like shows, plant shows, and things like that. Like, oh, black currants? And I'm like, no, they're terrible. Oh, I love them. <laughs> and it's like, well, you know, I gotta believe in the product. If I don't believe in a product, I just won't carry it anymore. Yeah. And even though there might be those that that want it, especially if it's not a great number, like like medlar trees. Yeah. Like, I, I like I bought I like I, I bought a bunch because people asked me for them and I just 
there, there was an English guy that was at, at a plant show one time. And he said, it's an acquired taste. And I was like, <laughs> I was like you know, I, I, I have not acquired it anyway. So, but, so that's why I'm like, I, I'm, I'm probably not going to continue to carry it because, you know, it's like for the very few that like it, but it, I got to believe in it. If I, if I think that it's just not good for anybody, um, I, I don't want to be part of that. I forgot to buy myself some lingonberries after you keep, you kept recommend, uh, recommending them to me. Yeah. Those um, I, I carry, those I like, I, I, and I, I'm it, mystified by them as well. Like I think that they're really an interesting plant and challenging, at least for me with the pH of soil that you need and versus what I have is limestone, you know, bedrock. So that buffering is just, it makes it very tough. They get chlorosis very easily. So, wow. Yeah, well, I actually have naturally a six pH here, so I would be, oh, be better. Yeah, the blue. This is like blueberry haven here somehow. I don't know how this ended up working out, but one day I took the pH of the soil. I thought it was higher, and then I walked around all the different parts of the yard. I was like, "Wait, it's a six here," and oh. um, the, there was like, "No wonder the blueberries do so great." Even I mean, I did put them in full peat moss originally. Then I planted two directly into the into the topsoil, and it they somehow have been fantastic. Um, and they're even extremely drought proof in this, uh, clay that I have. That's a six. Um, one of the fruits I really like is Gumi. I think I t may have told you about this before. Uh, have you? You did. And I, I started carrying it. So I'm, I'm excited to see. Good. You know? Yeah. I hope that they're, I don't know what variety you have, but, um, I know red gem and sweet scarlet are. Those are the two I have. Okay. Cause Carmine or Telemook is the other name for it is like four times the size of the other two. I heard that. Yeah. I don't know if they taste up to par. Like is the other one is Carmine four times the size and tastes better. I don't remember. Yeah. I don't remember because I grew sweet Scarlet and sweet and uh, the, the other one, red gem. Um, and then fruited them all roughly at the same, in the same year. And then got rid of the other two because I was like, wait a second, this one's just, it makes so much more sense. Um, but if you if you can't find Carmine, which is like nearly impossible to find it, people ask yeah. me all the time. They were asking me too, and they're like, Til well, they call it Tillamook, which I, I didn't know it by that. And and I, you know, bigger doesn't necessarily, as, as we look at it in things especially, Bigger doesn't mean always mean better. As a matter of fact, it's you know quite the opposite. I mean, I'm a, I'm a little fig guy too, like NDE and and um, you know fig lean and those. They're they're bursting with flavor. And I think, as you said, you know when you when you have these large fruits, that's a lot of water. That's a lot of you know. That's why you, you know, they lack so much flavor typically. And I'm I'm wondering if that's the case with with this one. I haven't tasted the uh, caramel, so I can't say. I just know that people have been asking me. I mean, just, I probably got several dozen people that asked me specifically for that one. And I said, no, I got these two. They're like, no, no, I want, I want a big goomy. And I'm like, <laughs> well, well, why, why do you want a big goomy? If, if it, I mean, I'm assuming, what if it, what if it doesn't taste as well? Mm -hmm. Like I'd rather have these little ones that are enjoyable, you know, than, than something that, you know, is, is, is flavorless. I think they know that based on my I've done so many videos now on it Bill I think they know that I really really love it um, but yeah again I think if you want the Gumi experience just grow you could probably get away with growing any of them I'm very curious to see if I could plant um, some seedlings and see what comes up I don't know how to even you know germinate them or what, what the process is to get that to happen um, but it's like the, the fruit that's the closest thing to wine that you can eat hmm. Um, I don't know if you've experienced that with yours, but they're, they have this lasting, um, flavor in your mouth, uh, even a mouth feel that's like, uh, five to 10 minutes after you eat them and wine doesn't even last that long, even a great wine. So I, I personally think they're amazing. Uh, I'm right. They're ripening right now, which is why I brought them up, but there's another plant called, uh, the autumn olive that they're related to. Yeah. Have you ever tried any of those? I'm not. I've, I've, I heard that they're invasive. I don't. I don't know that. Um, but I like. I grew in the same family. Those nitrogen fixers. I grew like sea buckthorn or sea berry, and they spread. 
all over the place. Oh, really? To get rid of the eradicate them. Is so I stopped growing them. Also because I didn't like the flavor of them. Like that, they're an orange berry. You know, they look cool. Um, love the foliage. Like those those olive types. You know, with that nice bluish kind of gray powdery. You know, foliage. It's it's attractive. But I I don't. I just heard some bad things about the autumn olive, so I didn't I didn't throw it. So I know the the, the autumn olive is invasive. I think they even consider gumi invasive. Is that right? Uh, I, I'm not hundred percent on that, but someone accused me in one of the videos and I was like, you know what? I don't care if it is invasive because I've never even seen one pop up. Like I would love it. <laughs> I would love it. If one of these gummies just, I'm trying to propagate these things for like years. Give me another one. Um, and I think it just comes down to the birds don't really eat the seed. They can't, it's such a big seed. Um, now, if the the autumn olive, they're eating the autumn olive seeds, and the seeds are smaller, and then they, you know, they poop them out, and then that that's how they're germinating. Then I could easily see that, and I know they are they are invasive in the wild. But does that mean I shouldn't plant it? Because what if I just protect it? You know, I put a net around it as soon as the fruits turn red, or really at that time of the year in the autumn, the birds are gone. They're not really eating anything anyway. Um, they're just doing something else. And so if I net it, the birds don't get to it. Is it going to be invasive? If I just spit a seed on the ground, is it invasive? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know how it works. Um, anyway, I'm interested to try it because the guy at Burnt Ridge Nursery, um, I forget his name. He's oh Michael Dolan, I think his name is. He's great. If you've ever seen any of his videos, he's got a great YouTube channel that is just to the point simple you know and he's got great information but uh he talks about uh the autumn olive and he convinced me to try one called uh ruby now there's a yellow varieties which apparently are pretty tasty and they may even be tastier than the red ones but um i picked ruby because he has just had a lot of good things to say about it and they keep breeding them and improving them i think the same thing with the sea buckthorn or the sea berry uh, in that they have a new one on One Green World's website I saw that is supposed to taste way better than the others fresh. I don't know if that's true. You have to try it, but... I bought a, I bought a handful, well, probably like six or seven. Um, okay. Like six or seven uh, trademark varieties. So I'm assuming, you know, when you trademark something, you're assuming that you're getting something that's better quality. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't find that to be the case. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, though. I feel like patents, and, you know, in the world of figs, like Little Miss Figgy. Do we really need a Little Miss Figgy plant? Do we need a uh, fig nominal? Probably. Probably not. Um, you know, I'm trying to find right now the sea berry that is recommended um, on their website because this thing, whatever it is, I feel like if you be the best person to ask because I'm not even going to waste my time if that's the case. Um they have 25 different sea berry varieties on one green yeah. world. Yeah, I mean, it, like, it's it's incredible. Like, they got, like, orange energy, orange power. There's a lot of them are either, like, Ukrainian, um, Russian. Like, that. It's I guess it's more popular over there. So um, what are some of the other fruits that – tell me besides, like, the, you know, the, um, the lingonberry. What are some of the other ones that you think people ought to look into? Uh, uh, jujube, for sure. Oh, oh really? Yeah, I, I had kind of a bad season last year, and I and I, I, it was so bad that I was like, I, I know how good they can be, like, and I've had them, but I think just like for me anyway, a lot of the fall figs were drowned out with a, with a lot of rain and not eating some cool temperatures, and I felt like the jujubes were didn't have a lot of flavor. It's uncharacteristic of what, what they typically are. Because I have like some friends that you know are also growing jujube and have longer longer than I have, um, just because it's more of their culture um, and super popular. And so you know they come and they taste mine and they're like, yeah, that's not good. You know, that's really? and and it, I know like I've had really really good ones before too. Like and, and I attribute it to the weather. I have to because you know I, I'm I'm used to the standard being up here and. From those same trees, so I know they're capable. Um, or, 
are you growing? Um, what, what variety are you growing? Oh, I have honey jar, uh, Lee, Shinesy Lee. And are you eating just fresh or dried? Fresh. Oh, okay. I really like them. I really like them that wow. way. Interesting. Um, I mean, I think I like I grow some Asian pear, which I think are some of my tops. Like yeah. their Shinseki. Shinseki is my favorite. Hmm. I mean, that's I bring that to school and everybody just just devours it, you know, and they're just like, you know, how can we buy this fruit from you? And I'm like, you just have it, you know, it's what I brought it here for. But it's it's just super, super sweet. And wow. I mean, it's there again, Shinseki is not a large, it's not like Korean giant. You know, this thing is a relatively small one, which drives a lot of people off and be like, well, I want a big fruit. It's like, well, why? You know, because there's nothing sweeter that like, I, I challenge anybody to find like apple, pear, whatever that's sweeter than Shinsei. I'll have to try it. Um, I don't think I've it's grown like that honey. One. It's yeah, like honey. Yeah, I have a Chojoro that tastes like honey. Um, actually, I think it tasted like cotton candy um, a couple of years ago. Um, I got rid of all the squirrels, and they were really just taking out all the apples and all the pears and they'll eat them when they're not even, you know, they're like this size and <laughs> I, I wasn't getting any. And so I finally trapped them and got rid of all of them. And there's almost no squirrels in the neighbor in like my backyard now. Um, and it's made a huge difference actually. It's really crazy. Um, even the birds are less crazy than they normally are. Um, Cause I think the squirrels go after everything and then the birds see the squirrels yeah. And then they're just like it's a f it's like a party, yeah. um, so getting rid of the squirrels was like getting rid of like the leader or something. Um, in any case, well, there is there is that it seems like there is that association just like with figs. It's like you get these problems where you know the figs will start blowing up. You get you know you get ants. You get you know some of the bees and and, and, and hornets and so forth because everybody joins a party because now it's it's open season. So if you can somehow, you know, when, when you don't have that, you don't have any of those problems. So it's probably like, you know, the, the, the squirrels, you know, let the birds know. And they, you know, that, that association is... Birds just, are smart, man. They'll, they, yeah. they'll, like, see you eating fruit, and they, then they'll know that it, it's there. You know, they're, they're smarter, a lot smarter than people, I think, give them credit for. Yeah, especially when it comes to, like, blueberries. I mean, I just, they will strip it clean. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I've had more trouble with with birds than anything whether it's netted or un unnetted like they're still you know if, if unless you have it you know where you have a pretty good birth around the around the bush like they'll go right through you know they'll stick their beak in there sometimes they get caught but they're you know they, they'll they'll strip it uh, the same thing with elderberries like what they're i don't really like them anyway but they like there's no elderberries to be had really there's, oh my goodness Wow, they're gone, and then I see little elderberry, little you know seedlings coming up because you know they deposit the seeds, and they just they're they're all over the place. They're, matter of fact, they're in between my fig trees. Like I'll see elderberries growing right in, you know where the where the crown of of it is is because you know they were dining on elderberries, came to the fig trees, seeing seeing what's up with that, if there's anything ready. And, wow, yeah, I haven't experienced that yet. Um... But yeah, in terms of the jujubes, real quick, I actually <laughs> bad news. I got rid of mine, um, hmm. except for Lee. Because, Lee's a good standard. That's well. I see. I found that I really liked sugar cane and honey jar fresh, but I was like, they're not better than an apple, and I'd rather just eat an apple. Now, the the one problem is getting good apples. But if you can get a really good apple, I just don't. There's only so much fruit at that time in the fall that I can eat anyway, and I just mm -hmm. wasn't eating them. So what I found is that if I dry them, and, and Lee, when you dry it, it transforms into, like, this amazing fruit. They're mm -hmm. like cardboard when they're fresh, I find, um, but they're way better dried, and it seems like they're meant for it. So then I just said, all right, I'll just keep the Lee, and that's what I eat anyway as, the dry, as them dried. So then I'll just eat them throughout the wintertime, and then... That way, I have jujubes. So, hmm. I don't know. I, I think some some people are like Ross. Give us a give us a jujube update in one of your videos, like a couple weeks ago. And I was like, oh, this isn't going to be good. Um, but anyway, so I think it's getting to that time, right, Bill? Um, 
I'm, you know, it's getting late here and I, I appreciate everything, this whole talk. I know, you know, all the, the trees and cuttings that you sell. I've always been a fan. I've always been a, a buyer. Um, I know you've helped me out in the past. You continue to help me out and everybody else out. And, um, so, you know, I just want to thank you for coming on here and sharing your wisdom with us and talking to me and having this, you know, you know, high level conversation about figs and, um, yeah, so please, you know, check out Bill's website, Off the Beaten Path Nursery, if you haven't already. Um, he's got the, the fig trees for sale currently. Um, we're going to be releasing this probably very soon, so there's going to be trees for sale. And then if you missed out, I know he's sold out of a, quite a few varieties, but he's going to be listing more as time goes on, and the sale will continue, right, Bill? Yeah, there's going to be like a second wave, and and for those that are subscribed, they'll they'll get a notification that it's coming and when when it's coming. But I mean, it's it's tough because you know, I try to make everybody happy, but I know it, you know there's only there's a limit to you know how how many of each variety. Certain ones are they sell out really fast sometimes because there's a demand, and sometimes because there's just there's not a lot of inventory that I have. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to sell as much as I can um, in terms of cuttings so that people can you know, start their own. And for those that maybe are unsuccessful or whatever, then, you know, I try to keep a few for myself just so that I can grow them into plants and then have them, have them have a chance to get them as, as plants rather than have to uh, go through that, that little bit of a, you know, it's, 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 it's tricky. I always look at a fig cutting as, as being like, it's a risk. It's risk reward. Like you're, you're only risking a couple of bucks typically, you know, and your reward is you get a tree. But if you know if, you, if you're unsuccessful, then eh, you're not out that much. Versus if you buy a tree, you know, you're getting a tree. It's gonna it's gonna live, but you know you might have to pay a little extra for it. Yeah, there's definitely a premium for the trees, and um, they're not easy to propagate either. And well, they are easy to propagate, but they're not easy to like you know as easy as you might think. There's a lot of work that goes into that whole process. Yeah. I mean, and, and what what kills me is I'll I'll, I'll be like. Well, this one made it, and then all of a sudden it goes. I call it like you know instant death syndrome, where all of a sudden something it's something happens. Like, hey, the leaf's curling. I yeah. mean, that's a prelude, right? You know, it's like what well, if it's only got a pair of leaves and one of them's curling? It's there's not a lot of success typically after that point, and you're like, I did everything right, you know, and, you know, and that's that's when the blame game starts really. But yeah. but it's like, well, you know, sometimes they're just not gonna make it, and you could do everything right, and it's just. They're not a hundred percent. You know, people get really good at them. They can be up at 85, 90% success, which is great. But you know, there's always something that's not in your control, but you, you know, it's just something nature wasn't meant to be. You know? Yeah. And it's just, you know, I think that's the part that people should appreciate too, is like, Hey, we, you know, you or I put in all this work, we're offering these up to the public, you know, it's not, it's not, I don't want to say don't complain, but it's like, you know, just think about all the, the time and effort and money that went into this and just the, the sheer and simple fact that we've even amassed such a collection and are offering just incredible genetics within Ficus Carica. So um, anyway, guys, I really do appreciate for everybody joining in on this talk. Um, please check out Bill's website, like I said. He's got a whole YouTube channel as well. I'm sure probably many of you guys have seen some of his videos. <laughs> And you may even encourage him to make a couple more videos because I'd love to see a lot more of his, uh, of his content. Um, so anyway, guys, take care. We'll catch you for the next one, all right? And uh, take care, everybody.